You want to drive faster? Listen in as Kinch Rendell, an SCCA National Trophy winner and multi-time pro solo champion himself, interviews the best autocrossers in the land. He talks fast and drives even faster. And now here's your host, Kinch Rendell. Hello, and this week's guest, let's see, he started back in 1997, was in D-Stock. Then he missed a year at Nationals after 1998, so yes, he went the next year he went to Nationals. In 2000, he was in E-Stock. And then he has some pretty high places here. Let's see, this last year, fourth place, third place, third place, third place, third place, third place, fourth place trophy, eighth place trophy. Let's see what else we could say about him. We're going to hear the story of why they call him Lefty. So some of you just clued in and are like, oh, I might know who that is. And that story is at the very end. I actually brought that up, and it, it was, I'm glad I asked it. It's pretty funny, pretty hilarious. <laughs> so F-125, he was there in the beginning, and nowadays he's still there, known as K-Mod. So Lefty Larry McLeod is this week's guest. It's pretty interesting how some of the things cart mod wise you can relate back to, I think, cars and anything else. So we talk quite a bit about a lot of things once again. And a few things I, I marked here, one of them big time is how much they have to listen for tuning, for driving, to knowing when to shift, not to shift. And then the whole concept really hit me of how much they have to shift and how many more chances for a mistake they have in that. And how much time he'll tell you it would take if you're going to jump into a cart for you to get used to the shifting where you're not even thinking about it. And what's interesting is here this past year in Pro Solo Wise, I, I think I almost forgot to bring up Pro Solo with him. And then I'm like, oh yeah, he won this past year. So he has a national championship in pro solo. He's pretty dominant. He won every event he went to, three pro solos and the finale. He knocked it out the park. So he's not just third place. He also has a pro solo championship. So once again, let's welcome Larry McLeod. Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Kent. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for thanks for agreeing. At first, just I want you to put this out there for other people that said no at first. You're like, no, I don't need to be on the show. So I really do appreciate you say, no, I'll go ahead and get on the show because quite a few people have been like, no, I don't want to talk. So you have to let them afterwards know it's okay, it's all right, it's fun. So where are you right now? Yeah, yeah, uh, I am. I'm sitting here, freezing cold, Michigan, just sort of surviving winter. Uh, probably not too different from how you're doing out there. Well, we, we can have uh, two seconds about that. It has been unusually warm. We have a race tomorrow. I haven't checked the schedule yet, but it was like 47 degrees while I go here. So we've um, missed on snow uh, and everything nice. else. Yeah, we've got a uh, ice solo scheduled for Sunday up in the uh, central area of lower Michigan. So we're going to head up there and do some of that with all the cold weather we had since Christmas till now. Even despite the warm days we just got through, hopefully we still have a lot of good ice we can go play on Sunday. And what do you drive, which we'll get into some more stuff, what do you drive on the ice? On the ice, actually, uh, my son Jackson, who also has been co-driving with me in the shifter cart for a couple of years, he has a 95 Toyota Celica on a set of snow tires, and we're just going to go play in that. Um, funny little bit about that car, it's got a bit of a history. Um, he purchased that car from Karina Jones, who is, of course, while she's the wife of Alex Jones. She, she and Alex have that uh, Pontiac Solstice they've been running there in uh, NFP. Well, she purchased the car from John Fessler, who used to autocross the car back in the late 90s, and um, he purchased the car from Jack Burns. So this car has kind of bounced around as an autocross car and landed in my, my son's lap as a little daily driver for his college commute, and... Um, we're going to keep up the tradition and put some snow tires on and go play on Sunday on the ice. Oh, very fun. So, so I went ahead and peeked yeah. at all your results for all the years. looks like at least Nationals, you, I think, started in like 1998. I was wondering, did you drive something besides carts? So take us back to the beginning when it looks like you were not in a cart. <clears throat> sure, sure. Yeah, I, uh, I got into the sport after I purchased a, a Nissan. It was a Nissan SER, uh, second generation in the 200SX type. And um, got involved with a couple of buddies who were sort of, you know, kind of tuner heads and just sort of having fun with it. And they got me started in the autocross world. Must have been spring of 97, first time I had run an event. Um, got my butt whooped by Aaron Miller, of all people, uh, back when he was running a stock neon. Um, obviously now he's multi-time champ in that, um, that Evo he's been running. But was, was kicking butt locally a long time back. Um, 
started out in that Nissan and ran locally and all, and I kind of had my eyes set. You know, I'm going to try try getting the Nationals in my second year. <clears throat> so that was the goal and um, was all ready to do that. And obviously ended up going to Nationals in that Nissan. At the time, it was D-Stock, so it was, uh, you know, myself and a whole bunch of Neons. Um, about six weeks before Nationals, my son was born. So we decided to not change plans. And my wife and I put my son six weeks old in the back of the car, and we drove, you know, at that point, it probably took us 20 hours to get from Michigan to Topeka. And um, <laughs> so we got out there, and my car was the only car in the class. Myself and my co-driver, uh, Bob Lou, was co-driver that year. We were the only car in the class that was not a Neon. There were 33 drivers and one lonely Nissan, and that was us. <laughs> um, yeah, it was... Uh, a great year to, be, to not be driving a Neon, I guess. Or maybe it was a bad year since I, I believe, if I go back and look, I think it was five seconds behind daddy and that was each course. Oh. So, um, <laughs> Mark has yeah, been, been so an I, alien you know, for a long time. He, 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 I guess, landed down here long, long ago. <laughs> yeah, that was in his Neon heyday. That was in everybody who was in, in Neons back then. Um, you know, you had a lot of people, Pat Washburn and, Nick Leverone and all these people that were running them back then. Um, and I was just hoping to not make a complete fool out of myself. I did not finish last, but I was way back from, from Mark and his world. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I ended up there in D what stock. Let me say right correctly. I finally got the D street in my head. Anyway, I guess in 2001, yeah. I showed up and the type R's at that point were all the rage. I didn't get it until mm-hmm. finally I said I better buy one. Yeah, and that's, that's a lot about how I started. I was in the wrong car in the class, but I was, you know, thinking, well, I'm not going to bother buying a Neon because I drove the car every day. I didn't want to drive a Neon every day. So I drove my Nissan every day. In fact, I still own the car. It's oh, nice. in the garage with a cover on it for the winter. Um, doesn't ever see snow and ice. Um, I still love the car. I just don't really. I ought to cross it locally once in a while. And, um, I even brought the cart to Nationals uh, on a little trailer behind it once or twice. So <laughs> it's still around. Um but actually, I ran that car nationals in 98. I skipped 99, um, buying house kids and all that. Went back in 2000 in the Nissan and again in, in uh, 2001 in the Nissan um, before I finally realized that Nissan really was not the car to have and it was time to do something else. Yeah, and it looks like you made the jump straight into F-125. How, how did that happen? Yeah, I did. You know, running here in the Detroit area, um, I used to run into all the local events, whether it was at the divisionals in Peru or over in Milwaukee, whatever. I would run into Alan Scheidler all the time, and he was kind of like the voice of F-125 at the time. He would run all the events by himself, and he kept everybody he met. Hey, you know, come on. It's like, you know, the fr- first hit is free. He would always <laughs> offer the co-drive anybody who wants to try it. So at the end of the uh, 2001 season, I said, hey, called him up. Hey, Alan, you still looking for a co-driver for next year? And uh, so I hooked up with him in the spring of, uh, I guess it would have been 2002. Um, ran, I think I co-drove with him twice, which is pretty ironic that I asked him to, for the whole season. That was our plan. What changed was <laughs> the class grew so fast, you had other people jump in, and one of those people was Mike McClintock. It was a name a lot of people probably recognize, also known as The Nut. Um, the Nut had bought his own cart, and I ended up co-driving with The Nut for most of the entire season, actually, we went to every weekend in a car. We went somewhere. And um, with, actually, at the time, Jeremiah McClintock, everybody knows, he was still in the junior car. And the three of us just went to everything and had a great time. And I ended up buying my own car <clears throat> and then went right to Nationals. We were still trying to become an official class. I think I think 02 was the last year before we got full national status, you know, trying to build numbers then. Um, just had so much fun, I just haven't really turned back. <laughs> Exactly. Paul Russell said it ruins him. He goes, every car now is ruined. I was like, oh, yeah, no kidding. I, I think fast cars would ruin me for these slower cars. And then you guys take it to a new level. You know, it's funny. I did listen to that podcast. And when he said that, I, I just sat there in my car going, yes, exactly. That it, For autocross, it completely ruins you because there's just such a thrill from every, all the dynamics and sensations. The challenge, it is so hard to get you know, a Paul Russell run, I'll, use, I'll give him a little props. It's hard to get that quality of a run uh, that it takes so much effort of your, your skills and setup and everything um, that everything else, when you go back, in a way, just kind of seems easy um, and sometimes boring. I mean, there's, there's some cars and days that are a lot of fun, but uh, a cart is always fun. 
<laughs> oh yeah. So how many runs and such were you getting back in the day when you first started and then when you started carding all the time? Like how many different events did you make in a year just to give people a perspective of what you were doing? Oh gosh. Uh, 2002, I, I think I may have taken two weekends off um, from the start of let's cause around here, Northern, you know, central U S Michigan area, we're, pretty much thawing out in April. So from about the middle of April through the middle of October, it was every weekend except maybe two. So you're wow. talking, what, 20, 22 of 24 events? Something like that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I guess because you can't race yeah. all year round like California. And that reminds me, when I exactly. shipped to nationals and someone was like, I've done 25 or 27 events. And I was like, this year? They're like, yeah. I'm like, I haven't done that many in total ever. It really hit me that people get a lot of seat time in a year if they really are going at it hard. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, and around here in the Upper Midwest, if you want to do it, it's it's um, a marathon. You've just got to keep going every weekend to something. And and back in I call back to the day. I start to feel old now when they say that. Um, there was a divisional series that encompassed what's now the Great Lakes Division and the the Central Division. It was always used to be one big division. And it was pretty popular. I think there were eight events. Typically, all of them were two day weekend events. Um, and it would go from you know Cincinnati to Escoda to Milwaukee. Peru would host maybe two of them. And I went between McClintock and I, and even with Shidler sometimes, we went to, I don't know, seven or eight of those things. I don't know. We went to a lot of them that year. Um, you see, you get a lot of seat time, not just for one event, but you're getting two-day weekends out of it and a lot of seat time. So it um, definitely helps a lot if you're going to progress is that seat time. And when making the jump from a front-wheel drive 140-horsepower car to a cart, I needed as much seat time as I could possibly get. Yeah, I wrote down, like, learning curve. What do you remember, mm -hmm. and what can you tell us about that? Uh, what I remember is you kind of have to throw everything out of the window. From where I came from, um, having only really ever rode across to that point for, what, four years, five years, and it was always in the same front-wheel drive car, I had to throw everything out of the window and just kind of start over um, because you start adding – the dynamics of rear wheel drive, the lightweight, the fact that you need a little bit of slip angle to it, and then the constant gear changes, um, which is something nobody else really ever has to deal with. When you first jump into a cart, that's one of the biggest things that separates the guys who are at, you know, in the trophies consistently and the ones that aren't. You can get guys that are fast, but if they have to now be doing 25 shifts in a 45-second run, Every one of those shifts is 25 times where you could make a mistake by short shifting, over revving, missing a downshift. Um, and that's such a hard thing. It takes probably, I would say, two years to three years, so probably 20 to 30 events to really get into the rhythm of how you've got to get the shifting down um, before you really get efficient at it and where it becomes almost, um, you know, second nature, like just like walking and talking at that point. Yeah, is there, did you ever go to the track to practice that? I know some local people that have just gotten to karting. They went to the track just to try to shift and shift and shift. It was a, it's a pretty small like, kart track. Yeah, I did. We we did a couple of those. Um, that one of the ones I remember was the beginning of the 2003 season. Um, after the 02 experience, we said, hey, let's go out middle of May, beginning of the year, let's go to a kart track. So we go to this track, and it was raining. And we sat in the truck for two hours and said, well, this is just stupid. Why are we sitting in the truck? Let's just go. And so we went out and started practicing on the track. And so we wanted to get all of us that went, we wanted to get used to the shifting and all that. What we ended up getting was real good seat time and rain to figure out what do you do when, you know, all your grip just goes away. Um, and that really has paid off a lot from that day. Um, you know, I'll get into where, what that may have helped with, but the fact that it helps you get a lot of seat time quickly. The only caveat to that when it comes to shifting is when you're on a car track and you run 50 laps you're running 50 laps in the exact same track you can get the shift points down perfectly for that track and as you know with autocross there is no that track you know the next day it's different different track you're on different configuration and all of a sudden your shift points don't matter anymore you've got to learn what the engine wants and what the cart wants and be able to adapt for all these different tracks you can't just try and do the same repetitive thing like you can at a uh, car track so is that a lot in, in the sound side of things? Are you listening to know on your card? Yeah, very typically, yes. Um, that's the rhythm you end up getting into is that sound. And that's when people jump into my card for the first time. I'll kind of coach them a little bit and tell them, you know, first thing is if it's quiet, then you need to downshift. If it's really too loud, you need to upshift. And that sound becomes a part of it because 
if you start focusing on feeling the power band, you're probably even too late because your head's going to whip back and you, the sensations start to take over. You have to really start thinking about that sound. And you got to know your engine and know where your peak points are to know when you're reaching up. Um, but you got to use the sound. Certainly there's no visual cue because everything's happening too fast. It's being just on sound. Wow. So I like that you said sound about quiet or loud, upshift, downshift, more so than the feeling. Yeah, and obviously sound travels really quickly. And if you're being thrown back or what have you. So do you have to do a dyno or something to know your engine? Or how are you? You said you have to know it. What does that mean? Well, that would be probably the faster and smarter way to do it. But, you know, uh, a lot of us, especially those autocrossers, were, were cheap, notoriously cheap. Um, the dyno time would be great in a smart way. But instead, I did it just through experience, just continuous seat time and trying different things and getting into the, you know, realizing where the power band was after so much time. And if I'm short shifting, in fact, now I use a lot of the GoPro camera video, I'll go back and I'll listen and I'll even find myself short shifting after the fact. So, well, that was just dumb. The next time out, I'm listening to make sure I'm hitting the revs where they're supposed to go. Well, so really it's a GoPro audio. So really you're using Mm -hmm. the video for the audio to think about shifting. Yes, exactly. And my son and I have gone through this since he started in the shifter about three years ago. One of the things he was doing is he was, sometimes he was short shifting really short and we'd have to watch the runs back to back and I could show him where I was shifting. And then there were days where he was shifting too late. But again, listening to the videos for the audio purpose. Yeah. So do you also use that to break down sections of time and such to look for who's faster or play them side by side or anything like that? Or are you mostly just on the audio? Uh, we, we've been using it for a lot of reasons. Certainly when he got started uh, jumping from junior carts to the shifter, it was just the basics of line, car control, shift points. But now that he's at more or less the same pace I am all the time, now we are looking to break it down and saying, okay, from start to this turn, who's quicker and why? And from the pin turn to the next one, <clears throat> who's quicker and why? And we start to really break segment by segment and compare you know, at this point, what, 60 frames per second, you can get down to, you know, a couple of hundredths and really get into that level. So you can click a couple of frames and say, okay, there's a tenth of a second. Um, so we definitely do that against each other now. It's interesting. It just hit me. That, like you're saying, the shifting is such a big deal. And if you're shifting at a different point, you might be on the same line. But just being a little bit of a torque band or what have you, you can take in that extra data about the sound of the car to know, hey, he upshifted a little bit later and he was faster. Because otherwise, maybe our lines were the same. You have that extra component there you do right and so typically we'll watch our runs back to back we'll know obviously what the result time was we'll look at spacing between elements and say okay who was faster than this element but if we're not quite sure because the line looks the same and the flip angle looks the same we'll go back and then list it again at full speed and decide wait was one shifting at a higher rev point than the other gotcha Um, and the funny we actually had a really good example of this last uh, winter about this time we did some changes to our engine. I, I basically ran the same engine for seven years, eight years, didn't really change anything. But last winter, we did some changes to carburetor and to the pipe, you know, two main elements. And we went out for the first event and didn't really know where the shift point was. And so we watched the runs afterward. And we realized that I was the one short shifting, but it's what the motor needed to do. And my son was trying to get the rest to stretch out, and it was just taking too much time. Uh, it was really interesting to have clearly – noting now we're deliberately one shifting at one point, one at the other, what the effect on the ultimate time was. Yeah, that's very interesting. Like, you don't need the dyno time per se. You can, especially the co-driver, you can try different things and look at it. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Want, as you got kind of into the, at least to me, it reminded me, you talked about gearing, that you guys are changing gearing. How often or you walk the course and guess for the gearing based on what you see? Do you count, count paces between things? How often is that correct, and how often are you changing between, let's say, sessions at a pro solo? Uh, you know, it's funny. I've, I've probably changed my philosophy on that a little bit over the years. Um, you go back 10 years ago, I was probably every single course, I was going one, two, higher or lower on the axle side and really trying to perfectly maximize it. Um, I don't really do that as much anymore. Um, I've been in the last two years probably three quarters of the time running one particular gear and only if I think I'm going to really run out or you meaning, you know, top out for an extended period of time in six gear or if um, 
I don't think I'm going to get to six, then I'll probably make a change to something else. Um, and I'm almost to the point now where the site itself, because a lot of times at one site, the course is mm. kind of similar to previous uh, courses on that site. I now kind of have an idea, hey, if I'm going to go to this site, I probably just need that gear. I'm just going to put it on and leave it. Um, so I don't do it as often as I used to. Now there's probably three different gears that I run, and it's only going to be the extremes when I change to either the really high or the really short gear. Okay, and is it something where you guys can go and count the teeth in the other carts to see what they have? Is that kosher? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've done that. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, I've got the gear I typically run, and, and Jeremiah McClintock and I, you know, we bit of a rivalry. We're both local here, and, you know, the last couple of years we've been really back and forth, even sharing data, so we know where we're always on. But we start talking to other drivers, um, talking to Paul, talking to Tom Harrington. And Harrington is the interesting one. You know, he's, he's got what he calls the... Uh, universal autocross gear. And it really doesn't matter what the number is. It's some gear that he's picked and he never changes it. Um, you know, that's his philosophy. He's just, just going to leave it alone. It's what I'm used to. I'm just going to go. Um, but I'll look at it and say, man, I think he's geared way too tall, for example, for a pro solo. And he's a pretty big guy. He's carrying a lot of weight on that card. I keep thinking, man, if he had a shorter gear, he'd probably be beating me off the line. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's that kind of philosophy. Like, well, I want to be short geared enough I can get off the line, but I don't know if I want to be as tall geared as Tom is for the rest of the course. So, yeah, we do a little bit of counting and comparing numbers, but that's the other thing about Cart Mod guys, and I use Cart Mod, the new F125 name, is we do a lot of, um, we're a really tight knit group. Um, there, to, an, to a point, there's a lot of sharing of, of information, a lot of. Um, a, Everyone's trying to help each other a little bit. Now, there's some extremes. You know, I don't think that Paul's going to tell me everything that his motor's doing. I don't think he's going to tell me every detail of his setup in terms of his caster and his tire pressures. But, you know, if it's <clears throat> if something I need that's clearly failing on my cart, he's going to help me take care of it and vice versa. It's just kind of that it's uh, very open friendly. We want to make sure that, uh, that everyone's got a fair shot to beat each other. Nice. Almost like SSC, I hope, turns out to be. <laughs> Yeah, see. yeah, in a way, similar, yeah, kind of that tight-knit group. Everybody's made their investment. They're not going to go anywhere for a while, and you're trying to build the class. And the way you do that is to you welcome new people in and you help them out. Yeah, and t tell me what you remember since you were in there from the beginning, how much things have changed if I brought out a cart from the first year or two till now. Yeah, and I, I, I can I give you my two cents on it. I know that Paul may have mentioned this uh, on his podcast as well. You go back to the early 2000s, and you could pretty much go buy something off the street and go out, and if you're a good enough driver, you can win nationals. Then it was not even, maybe that's the extreme example, but it was pretty close. Now you've got to make sure that you've got the absolute best tune that you can get your engine to do with the optimum jetting for that day, and you've got to have, um, you know, you've got to be due development on caster settings and on track width, and you really have to be perfectly prepared for that day or someone else is going to get you. Um, it, it's become that now that if you don't truly bring your A-game, the, the level of competition in cart mod is too good to get away with it. Yeah, and you brought um, up you look, jetting. It, Break us into the what, mm -hmm. how often you're changing jetting, how you know. So if we want to get into this, that still freaks me out. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this kid cart we have up sitting up there, I need to take it apart. And I'm reading online, like, oh, you need these three or four or five jets. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. So, so what does that involve, and what, what was the learning curve for yeah. you? Yeah. That's that's a very unique thing I think among probably autocrossers is you know how many other guys are out there changing their carburetors, let alone having a carburetor, but actually changing it, um, changing the jets on them. Um, I even talked to the guys running the C mod Formula Fords, and most of them were jetted for the year. Same thing with the F mod, the F 500s. Those guys pretty much put a jet in it and leave it. Us cart mod guys are a little bit more uh, willing to make that change, partly because we only have one carburetor. Um, one jet, it takes about a minute and a half to change it. So the fact that it's too easy makes it too easy. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you're constantly enticed to want to make the change to do it and see what works. Um, and the other issue is I think that these 125 motorcycle engines are tuned to so far to the limit. I think you have to really, you want to take advantage of it because if you're off on jetting, it will cost you. You'll, you'll feel a, a bit of a, a stumble in the engine or something just won't be right, and you know it's affecting you, and it's not hard to change, so you just do it. Um, the challenge, though, is knowing when and what to do, uh, and that's that's another piece of experience I developed because I, 
I'm, I'm a, I was a car guy as a kid. But I was a car guy who just appreciated cars, didn't really work on cars. I didn't, I didn't own anything carburetor other than a lawnmower, and I didn't know what I was doing on that either until I started dealing with the cart. And I had to kind of follow the lead of other people of what we were doing and learn what the variables do, the, you know, the main needle, the main jet, the slow jet, and all these different pieces. And you start to understand how they work, and then it began to, well, how does, how does it make my engine better? Which one do I need for what day? And I, I started getting a bit of feel to it, and you know, I was sort of tracking, okay, yesterday was a warmer day, today was a colder day. And as I started to do better, about, three, about four years ago, I guess, I started really getting, getting into logging my events. And I'm sure a lot of autocrossers are now, especially guys running you know, modern prepared cars or street mod cars, you start to log the conditions, log your setup and all that. I started doing this with my jetting setup too. And then now I'm actually capturing temperature, elevation, barometric pressure, um, other conditions that maybe are, but, and then I can chart what jet was doing for me on what days. I've gone one step further now, and I've actually, you know, because you can also use, like, relative air density gauges um, and do, like, baseline testing, and then if the air density changes, you give the percentage of what jet to use. I've actually taken a mathematical sense and created a, a chart that basically does that for me now. So if right. I declare that on one particular day's conditions, let's say, you know, 2016 or 2015 Nationals West Course Day 1, I had a great engine it's felt like the best it's ever felt i can go to document what conditions the atmosphere was at look at what jet i ran call that my baseline and then i can recalculate so if i go to a new site that's uh you know 400 feet different in elevation and it's a 20 degree cooler day i can now it'll spit out what jet i need to run as a main jet and it gets me 99 percent of the way there no that makes, yeah, I, that makes perfect sense once you have the data a ranger can easily use it mm -hmm. i like it yeah yeah, you know, there's, I started out simply. Um, I grabbed a couple of apps that would do, you put in elevation, air temp, and air and humidity level, and it would give you an approximate uh, uh, air density number. And I started using that a little bit. <clears throat> well, the next step, I wanted to get more accurate and actually taking in true barometric pressure readings into the, because you can find this stuff. You can you know, go to weather.com, and they'll tell you what your conditions today are. And the good thing is, most of the time we race airports, and airports are where all the weather reports come from, typically. So it's very easy to get real-time data. And I, I went to a buddy of mine, actually, it's Dan Sear, who you know lately has been running B-Mod and whatnot, and run CARP Mod sometimes. He's a bit of a, an engineering geek, to say the least. Um, and I said, hey, Dan, go make me a spreadsheet or calculator that does this. And in about 10 minutes, of course, he whips something up and emails it to me. He says, you know. Um, and I've been using that now for two years. It works and, great. And so far, so good. Like, you set it, and if the temperature or something really changes, then you might change your jetting. Otherwise, you're good to go. Yeah, and it's funny. I'm learning now that temperature's got to shift probably about mm, maybe even 15 degrees before it starts to have an effect. But what seems to play along, uh, part of it is elevation. So I'll run at Toledo, which is uh, 660 feet above sea level, and then I'll go up to the upper peninsula in Michigan, and it's 750 feet, or I'll go to Lincoln, and it's 1,219 feet, that's where I got to start making those adjustments for jetting. And I'm sure if I was out there in Colorado at 5,000 feet or whatever, it'd be even leaner. So, but the, the calculations would at least get me pretty close. There may still be a need for slight adjustment from that, but you're going to get 95% of the way there just with the calculation. Oh, that's interesting. So temperature, 15 degrees difference before you would probably need a jet change, but the elevation mm -hmm. you realize is the bigger deal. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. That's it is, yeah. Kind of makes sense because you just have that much less air up here, so it would be leaner. Huh. Mm hmm Right. Yeah, so, big, big uh, contributor to that. And, and I thought I heard or read somewhere back when I was playing around with indoor karting that you can kind of hear the engine. Is that the same for you guys? Can you hear, or are you just feeling that it's not as powerful? Um, there is a sound difference sometimes, especially if it's start, you know, it's a lot when it's running extra lean. Um, it'll do two things. You'll hear a... Uh, Hard to even describe, but there's a different sound. But it also you'll feel the power, especially if it starts to you're running extended open throttle. It'll start to, to die power a little bit. Um, and if it's rich, you know it'll um, you can hear sometimes, especially with like the the KT100 kid carts motors. Oh my gosh, those things! If they're running a little rich, they gurgle like a you know like they're choking on themselves. Um, and you can definitely hear them. And with my kids in the junior carts, I had no other way to 
because I wasn't in the car and I couldn't tell exactly from the seat of the pants what it's doing. I had to always just listen and then just their their needles from there. A whole different way to do it, but you know, sometimes it's all you can do is listen and try and understand what it might be doing. I want my kids to race maybe this year since we have outdoor go kart. They're doing a lot more of that that they'll actually do this, but I'm also pretty scared about oh how much time will it take. Yeah, if you're if you're getting your kids started, um, <clears throat> it's a different place now than when it was. And my son started almost ten years ago. Uh, it's just different engines now. Um, now, of course, this season we're going to see all these new safety regulations coming in. It's going to be a challenge to parents on the logistics side and a challenge to the event um, administrators. So it's a little different world, but. At the end of the day, you know, just want to get your kids started and get your kids seat time to be a better driver, more responsible, to understand the concept, and you can use it as a motivator too for getting their room clean or getting their you know grades up or whatever. All right. So speaking with the, um, let's go back. I was trying to remember. I should have written down right there what you're saying about the kids carting and the anything about the jetting side of that. You're saying the elevation and that with the kids cart. Oh, you were saying the sound difference there because you weren't actually in the cart, you had to rely on something else to know the jetting to change or not to change. Right. And that's where, you know, and that's being a cart driver and then having a kid come along helps me a little ways. I can kind of um, learn both sides and apply what I learned on one to the other. Um, but when it comes specifically to jetting, the difference is, or any setup, you think about it, in my own cart, I can feel what it's doing or I can feel the engine and I'm right there real time. But with my kids, you don't. You're standing outside at the start line watching the course, and you have to use some kind of sound to understand what it's doing, especially when you've got a you know, 9, 10, 11-year-old that doesn't know even what the card's doing. You have to listen for yourself, and sound becomes a big big part of is the jetting right or not. Yeah, it makes sense. Like, you can't feel it. Cause it makes sense. You're driving your car a whole bunch, and then, oh, it doesn't feel as good. Basically, I get that in a Civic or any other car that you drive – even in Lincoln, which seems like sea level to us, it has so much more power. And you come here and you're like, oh, yeah. that or I, I realized when I went to Texas, I guess two years ago and didn't do well in Lincoln, I felt like I was driving great. I just, the car was down on power. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that. Whereas I think you all would notice, it sounds to me like you would notice if you're off on power by very much. Yeah, you, you ran that engine for how long? Um... Yeah, I've been basically the Honda engine I've got, I've been running since 2002, but it's been an evolution. I did a lot of upgrades between 2003 and maybe 2006, between um, pipe changes, I had the cylinder reworked, I had the head reworked, I did a lot of things initially, but then from 2006 until probably the beginning of last year, I hadn't really done anything setup-wise. I mean, I obviously do you do servicing, but never any setup changes, so then... Starting 2017 season, a year ago, um, I decided to go a little further. Now we've got rules in the class that allow bigger carburetors, so I figured I'd give it a shot and then match to that a new pipe, trying to find the right combination of power bands. So you obviously you want peak power, but you want broad power. And that's – so you start looking at those things. So it really was a shift for me going into last season to, to learn to drive the engine a little bit differently than I had the old engine. And are you sending this thing off? You, it doesn't sound like you dynoed it. Well, are you just changing this stuff yourself and just driving it and seeing? And like put a different pipe on and um, try it, do it again? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to pull the curtain back too far, but I'm, I am poor. I'm, I'm very cheap. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of autocrosses are, but I'm ridiculously cheap. Um, I love what I'm doing. I, I have to balance out. A lot of us do between the whole life and um, racing and kids and family and all that. So I don't want to spend too much, but I want to spend bang for the buck. Yeah. If I were smart and if I really you know, wanted to truly go further, yes, I would do dynos. Frankly, I just haven't. Yeah. Um, I even have my son now, who's he's on the Formula Car team for the University of Michigan, and they're constantly dynoing their engine, and he keeps telling me we should do this for the cart. <laughs> just haven't. So I'm, a lot of it is a little bit of guesswork, a little bit of theory, um, with a, as much seat of the pants as I think I can apply. Um, you know, and I, I, the only time you can really tell between carts is if you can drive someone else's back-to-back, and I've done a little bit of that with other people's cards, and I think mine's my power plant's at least in the ballpark. And considering results in the last year, I, I'd say I'm I'm in there. I'm in the range. Yeah, gotcha. Even, even I'm looking at just results: 2015, 14, 13, and 12, third place. So unless you were way behind, you're you're obviously the engine's okay. 
Yeah, yeah, and you know, I had a good run there. The engine was always in the mix. Um, unfortunately, those those years, 11 through 15, just Paul Russell was almost checking out every year. The only year we, I say we, myself and Jeremiah McClintock, we had a good shot to take him down was 2012. Um, I had top time on the West Course day one, and Jeremiah had top time in the class on the East Course on the second day, but neither one of us could finish ahead of Paul Russell. Um, so you got it. Obviously, it goes back to the old adage: you got to do two good days. But power plant wise, setup wise, that was the year that the two of us were the closest. But Paul, if you look at the overalls, Paul had some tremendous years where he just checked out. You know, I hate to say too many nice things about him, but yeah, he had some years where it was just stellar, stellar performances. And it was, it's tough when a guy's in that kind of rhythm to, uh, as you know, he takes somebody like that down. It's just. It's tough in a run. You know, you go back to Batarash and ESP when he had that run going, and somebody gets in that role, man, it's, it's a tough hill to climb to catch him. Oh, exactly, exactly. So tell us, what do you think it would cost for us to get into a cart if we want to get into the class, and what does it cost during, throughout the year money-wise? And you could throw in the time also, but what, what's it really looking at to get into one of the fastest vehicles out there? Yeah, it's, it's actually, I would say, the, the cheapest bang for the buck you can get, bar none. Um, you can go buy a used car package, and I think Paul gave some good tips, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time, but I'll give you the basics. For probably $5,000, you can be all in, ready to finish. If you're a good enough driver, you can finish probably on the podium in a $5,000 package. Wow. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It, they're out there. Obviously, you got to get the setup right, but if, you know, even with some of the guys now that are mid-pack who maybe are running old equipment, that is one way they could make this step up. And that's, that's cheap. I mean, you can't run pretty much anything for that anymore. Um, so that's the great way. The running costs are fairly low, and, I mean, it's kind of becoming legendary now. Cheap cart tires are uh, at $220 a set. Uh, I actually cracked open six sets of tires last year. Um, I think I still have three of them in, in tight sealed plastic bags in my basement, you know, because I'll run one set for the Pro Finale and one set for Nationals, and, uh, there are guys that will run one set on day one of nationals and another set on day two for nationals. So it's it's that cheap. And then we just use them up at local events, you know, like anybody would later on. You usually get, depending on surface, if you're on asphalt, you're going to get 120, 130 runs. If you're on concrete, you're going to get 60 to 100, depending on how hard you use them. So they last pretty good. Cool. I'm, I'm just taking out some notes. There's 60 to 100 runs on concrete at 220 bucks a set. That, that's mighty yeah. impressive. And I think you're right, 5000 bucks. You can probably buy an STS Civic, maybe. I mean, you can also spend that much on shocks if you wanted to. So that that's yeah. pretty. And also, I, I've not been in one, so I don't know how bumpy things are. But I'm impressed because a lot of you guys are not spring chickens. You're not the youngsters at 20 years old doing this. What is the physical toll or not? Or is it just worth it? Or is it nothing to think about? Um, It's fun. It's funny you mention that because the guys that have been in the class the longest, like Paul Russell and Tom Harrington, myself, Paul Durr, I mean, there's a couple of guys of us that it's just every year we know that at least those of us are always going to be out there. Um, we, Paul, I think it was Paul or Tom started calling it the graying of F-125. Um, <laughs> none of us are going anywhere, but we're just getting a lot of grayer doing it. Uh, we're trying to bring in new blood, obviously, but I, it's not as bad as it seems. Um, there is a bit of a physical element, but it's not like you think. It, it, we don't get out of the thing and immediately go into a back brace or something. Um, I don't, you know, I don't take two Dolan's pills when I get out or something like that. It's, it's if your cart set up right, it's actually comfortable. And the big bumps are just annoying because it prevents you from do, taking the line you want, doing what you want on the course. But it's not really painful. I've, I've had a couple of painful bumps but again i go back to running a bigger seat than i was supposed to or one day i wasn't wearing a rib vest and yeah those those come in but i worry more about the damage it does to the equipment than it does to my own body yeah you're, you're malleable enough you're flexible enough that you can take the little bumps and you're are you at a chiropractor yeah. every week every other week any chiropractor work it, it's like it's actually funny uh, my wife actually works for a chiropractor but i've never been to one <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, but no, I, I I tell you what I have done though. Being in my 40s now, um, I want to keep doing this, and I'm a I'm an energy person. Um, if you see me at an autocross, I can guarantee you I won't be sitting down unless I'm helmet on in the seat of the cart. 
I'm always on the move. And I got to the point about two years ago where I was just getting exhausted. And a lot of us get this way. And I felt like I couldn't quite do what I wanted to do. Even in an autocross run, I would just kind of get more exhausted. So I just started getting myself in better shape. Um, just a general, nothing extreme, but just to kind of pay attention to it a little more as we get older. And it's probably something everybody does, but when you're trying to deal with a cart, the things, it's not the driving and the bumping and all that. It's the lifting the cart on the stand. It's loading it in the trailer. It's the other pieces of the physical side of just operating it that you just can't, you can't have a bad back. You can't have bad knees. You, you probably just need to, you know, keep yourself in good enough shape that you can keep doing these things without pulling a muscle or throwing it back out. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. We're moving some tires around. Some people really large tires. You're moving the whole cart and I see people dragging them. I don't know if it's at our event mm -hmm. or just at the track. One time I saw somebody had the automatic lifting, like they put their cart on, I, I may, they lifted it a little bit and then it would automatically pick it up high for them. So I've seen that as well. Yeah. I, I guess the guy was a bit older. So I guess even if you really want to do it, you can have that. Yeah, it actually it even motorized, I think, and it would, instead of him pulling it, he could basically drive it to where he wanted it to go. Have you seen that? Am I yeah. making stuff up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, the motorized lifts, there's a couple of guys that have them. Um, they're kind of novelty. It's nice. You just got to have a charged battery around. And um, I prefer not to go that route, but, but they're out. There's certainly guys who go to a lot of events, and they're the only cart guy there. It's hard to find a friend always to lift it on the ground, so having those one-man stands are nice. Um, but it's still a challenge. You know, you think about Lincoln, all of us in carts, we're just, we're dying to get good paddock spots because if you row 26 and you've got to get all the way to grid, it's a mile. You're pushing your cart all the way up there, or you, or you got to find someone with a golf cart to drag you up there. And it's, it's just kind of a pain, but that's why I like to stay in just enough shape that I can push my cart down to the grid and back up without feeling like I'm going to, you know, like I'm going to die. Uh, so if you want to stay in shape, get in the class and realize you're going to get some extra workout. So you better be ready. That's a, that's one thing Paul mentioned. I think when I, I don't know if it's on the podcast, but I talked to him about karting way back when in person. And he said the physical toll it takes if you go to like the super nationals or what have you, he goes, you have to have a crew there. And that's what blew me away when I went to a local race. How many people hired a crew or at least one or two people to help them do all the things they had to do? It just boggled my mind. But actually what you're saying, kind of that happens at our level because if you're at nationals and you're road whatever, 10 or five, there's a lot of energy expended moving back and forth. Yeah, there is. And I don't want to scare anybody off who's sitting on the fence about doing it. It's not as bad as maybe it sounds. These are all just some of the things. But in my experience now, and you know, I'm, I'm 44 now, and you just get to the point where i got to keep in shape just so I don't, you know, completely collapse, you know, just trying to get to grid or something. And it's just a, a self-conscious thing I've done. I just want to make sure I maintain it. it you know, and also it helps you in cart mod that there's a weight factor. It's a mod class. Um, the carts weigh about 200 pounds, give or take, maybe 210, and the minimum weight's 385, which means if you're more than 180 pounds, you're probably not near a minimum weight. Um, and that, that scares some people off, but, you know, you just, you got to get close to that. And there's a lot of guys that have made that push to try and get there. Um, you know, think about a Jeremiah McClintock, you know, he, he got himself in much better shape two years ago when he, when he started getting back into the cart specifically to make sure he was getting his weight down as far as he felt he, he needed to to be competitive. And I'm sure Paul's the same way. I think he even mentioned plays a lot of tennis, stays active, doesn't want to gain that weight. And you kind of have to pay attention to that if you're in any mod class, even the guys in, in the F mods or C mods. They're, they're certainly paid. You know David Faust, and, you know, in order to win C mod like he's done, he's got to keep his weight down too. He just, that's what we all have to do. That, and if nothing else, if you want to get one of these classes, hey, maybe that's the final thing that'll help you keep the weight off. And yeah, David, yeah. May, maybe David's taking that into account. Plus, to fit into C mod, I'm much more <laughs> shaped like Barryot is than he is. So maybe that's part of it. It's like, hey, I better stay nice oh, and trim here. Yeah, I mean, I I, I talked. He was actually like one of the guys running D stock back in the old late '90s, you know, in the old neons and. He was a bigger guy. You, I, I've heard, I haven't talked to him much, but I, I've heard that he's actively made sure that he gets his weight down so in getting thinner so he can run that car. And that's, that's the dedication, whatever your motivation is, it's good for you. But if you really want to compete, that's where you're at. And obviously, Balt is you know, one of the best competitors out there. He's focused on it, and it, it's nothing else. It gives you a good motivation to get yourself in good shape, um, whether you're doing it for age preservation or <laughs> for whatever your motivation uh, it's always a good thing. Oh, exactly. And that's where, so you talk about the physical of moving the cart around. 
how much difference is a physical, besides the shifting, inside the cart? I mean, is there anything special? Is steering harder, easier? Is there anything else that is different big time because you're in a cart? Um, it, it's a little bit, you know, and I'm a, I'm a fairly scrawny guy. And, you know, it, it is a little bit of, you want to make sure you have enough control. Um, you know, that if you've got, uh, if you're a little bit weak in the arms, sometimes if you do hit bumps, you, the steering will move around. And it's a very heavy caster um, steering system. So any kind of bump or any jostling, it, it will give a little bit to your arms and shoulders. And again, it's not going to hurt. It's just about you want to maintain that control and not feel like the cart's moving you. You want to be in control of it. Um, so, yeah, there's a little bit of that. And yeah, that's where I see you all sliding around quite a bit, like you had mentioned. It needs some slip angle. Is it some of that mm -hmm. slip angle induced because of bumps and something else and you're counter steering a lot? That's what I feel like I see in the videos. Or what are you really um, feeling and doing in the cart? Are you inducing some of that? Or Yeah, you, sometimes you are. Um, I'll go, I've actually, in the last couple of years, I've changed chassis. My old chassis was set up that actually needed a lot of slip angle. It's just the way it, it worked. Um, so it was definitely induced. Um, a lot of it would be, you know, if you're going through a slalom, I would have this technique where I would almost have it pitched 10 degrees sliding before I get to the first cone of the slalom. And as I'm passing the first cone, I'm basically pitching already to, to get ready for the next one. And it, it became a series of pitches as opposed to kind of linear um, oscillation. It's changed depending on setup. And, and I'm now running this newer chassis. It's a little softer. And um, it doesn't like that. It likes more of the, the linear roll a lot like maybe one degree, two degrees of slip angle tops. It's not, it's not the big slide monster that it used to be. But there's a lot of guys, if you watch the class run, it's a lot of fun, I'll tell you that. Um, but there's a lot of guys, chassis are just set up for a lot more of a slip angle. Um, but a funny little bit on that, my son and I, like I mentioned, we've been co-driving, and when we made the transition to the newer chassis, I was warned up front by, the, by Eric Nelson, actually, is the guy that helped me broker the deal and gave me a lot of good setup advice from seventh gear karting. He's not a crosser. He ran nationals and pro finale this year. And he was very clear with me, do not slide this chassis. It will not work. And between my son and I, I took that message and I ran with it. I was not going to slide. My son would come back from a run and say, man, that was a lot of fun. I'm looking at him telling, but you're sliding it. You look like you're ice racing out there. He says, yeah, but I'm having fun. The problem was he was, he was overheating the tires. So by the time I go to take a run, <laughs> the tires are all grained and they're just too hot. We're like spraying them down. And it, it was, uh, it, we kind of had to adjust technique a little bit to to make sure it worked as a two-driver vehicle without inducing too much slide. Now, how was his times compared to yours before they got really hot? Was he competitive sliding around, or was it just fun? Uh, he could, yeah. Yeah, actually, he could be close. For example, a 40-second run, he might be a half a second off my time doing it with the sliding. The problem is the next run, the, if you're especially in a two-driver scenario with a five-minute back-to-back, the tires adjust get to be so greasy it's hard um it's hard to then get another good run out of it um so that's where you know we really get into tire temperature managing now to make sure that you're not overheating them um so this year we did a lot of, last year i should say now we did a lot of spraying we did a lot of keeping them cool we ran a lot of hot weather days and back to back um and on certain especially concrete sites if you do that that are kind of um yeah like Oscoda is one of we run a lot it's concrete. It, when we run there, it's a low attendance event. And you, if you just the bare concrete and you're just sliding across them, it's just going to tear the tire apart. Now, the pro finale with 270 entrants or whatever it is, all those runs down there, you can get away with a lot more because now you're on the rubber. You're not actually on the concrete anymore. Oh, um, so it doesn't shred the tires as much. Not at all, yeah. Um, and that's why, if, if you've noticed, that Paul mentioned this too, that carts in the pro finale do fairly well, and a lot of it has to do with the heat and the frequency of all the cars running on the exact same course so quickly that the carts now all of a sudden, if you can stay clean and get past that first round of the challenge, you've got a really good shot to continue because the cart's going to get faster and faster and faster the further the day goes on. Oh, interesting. And I want to go back and circle back to you said changing from sliding to more linear made me wonder, because in karting, what I learned, and I was like, why am I so slow in indoor karting? You have to lift the rear tire off the ground for it to turn properly. But now I'm thinking you could slide it instead of getting that rear wheel to lift. Am I thinking properly like you were sliding yeah. it instead of getting yeah. the time to pitch the wheel up in the air? 
Yeah, the, the idea and the concept of lifting the inside rear is absolutely true because it's a fixed solid axle uh, non-differential vehicle. You have to lift, but in practicality, you're not always lifting it. You're just deloading it enough to where now the load's transferred and you can actually get it to turn. It'll slip. Um, Basically, the inside the, tire can then slip yeah, it, a little bit. Yeah, and the, the, the real trick to set up is, is getting that lift correct. And so if you've got a high grip surface, you know, it's a real rubbered in track or, you know, pro finale, whatever, you want to actually probably stiffen things up because you don't want to lift it so early. Because if you go out there on a really soft setup at all this grip, it's going to lift so high, the cart's going to be uncontrollable, maybe even go up on two wheels. But if you're on a green track, it's cold and no one's been out there, you got to soften things up to get enough weight transfer to the other side. Otherwise, it's just going to understeer everywhere. So that's, if there's one key to making a, a cart go fast, it's managing that lift of that inside rear tire. That's really what it's all about. Now, I guess you don't need to make a chart to figure out when and what to do there, but maybe you're taking in, oh, in Lincoln, basically this is what I need for a setup, or are you actually changing your setup soft based on temperatures or lot also? Uh, yeah, I've actually gotten to that, especially with this newer cart that I've got that has a lot more the knobs to play with. I'm starting to track those knobs as I go to different sites and do different tests and tunes as to what each one does. And with a cart, you can change so many things. I try to limit it to a couple that are the easier ones. Um, but if you really want, I mean, and I've seen it, you can swap an entire axle between runs if you wanted to. For width um, you just or, or stiffness or both? Yeah. For stiffness, yeah. Um, so if you really felt like you're getting not enough lift, too much lift, and you think the axle is the solution, if you got all the tools and parts ready to go, it, and preferably at least two people, it can be done pretty quickly. But it's not as easy as maybe there's a, this, it's kind of like a sway bar. It's a chassis bar on the front of the chassis. It takes, you know, it's four little uh, clamp nuts or bolts that go through. You just two little clamps, pop them on, pop them off, and the bars are in and out in 20 seconds. I can actually do it between runs at a pro solo if I wanted to. It's that quick. Oh, wow. So. Yeah, you, you tend to try those things before you go trying, like, an axle swap. <clears throat> but, you know, when you're doing development, you could change wheels. You could change hubs. You can change the seat position. You can change the number of attachments from the seat to the frame. There's so many different knobs to turn. You, if you want to be fast, and I mentioned that earlier, you've got to be set up right for to compete with the top guys, but you don't do that the last weekend before nationals. That yeah. starts the year before. <laughs> So, so that's interesting that you now made me think of all the different things you can do with caster and camber, and I've seen some of the little knobs you can turn now. That mm -hmm. how much of that, I, I think that you have to probably like that or you want to be competitive. How are you basing the feel of the cart? Are you looking at times and saying, hey, I'm too slow based on my competition? Is it a feel thing at this point to know that that tire is lifting up too quickly or too slowly, let's say for a slalom or something else? Yeah, when, when you're at an event, I mean, like any autocrosser, you look at the guy I, I always think about is like Mike Meyer and that the Mustang he and Stegnaro are running, always turning knobs, right? But he knows which knobs do certain things. So if you feel, but you can't necessarily look at the clock and all that, but you're going to look at some level of data. You're going to take in some subjective understanding of what you just felt and then turn a knob. Cards can be the same way within the competition of an event, really no different. Um, but like anybody else, the key to understanding those knobs is going to be through testing in a year before nationals, certainly the spring before nationals. It's going through those progressions like anything else, like you would in your, in your Civic, your Type R, anything else. You're going to try, whether it's tire pressures or whether it's ST, and you're going to try shock settings and sway bars and all these other things. We do the same thing. We're going to try them all, see what they do, get it set up right for one site, and then be ready to adapt to the next site when we get there. Yeah, so you, it's probably just like in a car, you can tell if it's slipping or sliding too much. Or with this new car, is it basically your inputs that were making it slide, or that was set up slash and inputs? Yeah, you can, you can make any car slide with inputs if you really wanted to. Um, it's just not always the fast way. Yeah, so, so you were talking to your son, you're probably like, change the technique of what you're doing. Obviously, you weren't changing <laughs> price setup between the two of you. Right, and I was at that time, I, I was on pretty good knowledge that we didn't want to slide it. We'd rather be on a, a neutral setup or a linear setup because ultimately that's the faster result. That's the setup we're on. The old chassis, 
I had everything stiffened up, and you could throw that thing around, and it was a hoot. It was an absolute blast. Um, it just, as you looked at the results, I kept finishing third every year, and I was reaching a, point, a plateau where I thought I have to change something or I'm never going to get past third place. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, honestly, that's what it was. It's, I've taken it to a new level now, this whole third place thing. You know, my, my number now on my car is 33. Um, it's, <laughs> it, you know, even, um, you know, at, at National this year, I think it was, uh, um, uh, I think the announcer of the banquet even said when I finished fourth, he said something like he was actually, here comes a guy, he probably wishes he finished third, but then again, he's been there before, and then, you know, it's just going to finish fourth. Um, it's kind of becoming that kind of joke, but it's, it's good. Hey. If I can finish third every year, I'll, I'll take that level of consistency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, you're, you're right there. And you're like, there's got to be something, just something a little bit different to try. And that's where at least you're experimenting. That's the biggest thing, I think. And over the years, I've done some of that. I mean, I turn a lot of knobs, but I've tried techniques, and I'm always thinking this or thinking that. What can I do to get better? It, that's the ultimate challenge to me is how can I be e even more consistent? And oddly enough, this last Nationals, I, I don't know, if I was sixth or seventh or ninth or whatever, I felt like I drove really, really well. It was it, the weirdest feeling yet. I left nationals not having won, and yet I'm like, no, I drove my, I drove really well. I thought, I kind of felt like I gave it my all, and I, I would just kind of, I guess, want to back my mind, blame the car, be like, yeah, and Stephen Yo didn't beat me, and he also thought the car was a little slow. So it's kind of, for the first time since I guess I started going in 2001, I didn't win. It wasn't like, oh man, that's such a disappointment. So I like what you're saying. Finishing, really finishing that high up or close, even if you're just time wise. Let's say you're fifth, but not back by much. It's still a heck of an accomplishment. Yeah, and I, after a couple of years, you know, the first time I did it, I had just come from a break of a couple of years. I had gone back to business school and everything, wasn't able to make the national. I was so happy. I couldn't believe I finished third. The next year, I actually coned away the win, and it was frustrating, but, okay, I got the pace. And then the third time, it was, okay, I wasn't supposed to finish third again. And then the fourth time, and then the fifth time, and then around that, I got so frustrated. But then I started looking back and saying, wait a second. These are a pretty darn good group of drivers that I'm finishing ahead of. Yeah, I'm losing to Paul. You know, I, I could give you the names of everybody I finished third behind, first and second. But they're all great drivers. I just, now I'm recognizing there's a lot of guys that I was beating that were really good drivers too. Um, and I, now, I guess, age, a little bit of wisdom, whatever, starting to appreciate that more than I did in the past. Yeah, exactly. And that's where I've got to too. It's like, yeah, I still have the goal of winning, but... Like you said, there's a lot of other things going on there, and you can actually realize when you're driving well or did drive well, kind of go, okay, check. And plus, just being positive. That's the other thing is be positive. How could I maybe get faster and not be too ticked off at yourself or something else going on there? So, that, so that's a lot on the setup. Right. I like some of the things you were sharing there for all the things you yeah. can try and do and then how quickly you can actually do those things. Plus, the best advice you said is you start the year ahead of time. Plus, with this just shifting, I realize how much time it will take to learn to shift the, shift the carts. Yeah, absolutely. And anybody will tell you the same thing in any class. Certainly, the more knobs are available to you, the earlier you got to start. But you don't expect to show up at Nationals with a car you just bought. Um, you know, you've got to go through the development time and get used to it. And it's just not easy. And the other factor that I've, in, in my experience of autocross now and what, 15, 16 Nationals, whatever I've been to, is I love the event. I love the, everybody does. We love the culture of it, the family aspect. You know, this, this vacation with 1,200 or 1,300 of my favorite friends that we just kind of hang out for a week and, oh, yeah, by the way, we take a couple of runs around these two courses. And I love that. And in addition to that, you know, I've gotten into this announcing gig over the years, and I actually spend a lot of time preparing for it. Yeah, I work long days now, but I love it. And I've had people tell me they think that if I would stop doing that, just take a course working or grid working gig, that I'd probably be able to focus more on driving and potentially even finish my position – but I'm not willing to because I, I don't want to give that part up. Yeah, it's like icing on the cake or, or a major portion of the cake, I guess, the, uh, of enjoyment there. It, it really has become that way, you know. It started out, I think the first year I announced might have been 2000. It might have actually, I think it was September 11th was the first time I was uh, behind the, the microphone at Nationals um, announcing for E Prepared with John Thomas and B Mod with, I think, Benny DeMent might have won that year. But uh, I just, that was my first exposure to it, having a couple of local announcing gigs, whatever. But I got to do it there, and I thought, I want to keep this gig. So as I got back to the next national, next, I always made sure that I somehow landed that gig. And it's not easy. You know, it's, it's, they're selective about it, so you have to kind of work on it. Um, 
And I've got to the point now, I, I love it in that I can, I love the storytelling. Um, to, to do the research on the classes you're going to announce, understand all the players, tell that story throughout the two days and so that everybody sitting at home on the Ustream or sitting in the grandstands or even, you know, people in grid feel like they're part of this whole, like, it's not just six minutes of racing. It's a whole season that's been going on and there's people, there's rivalries, there's setup, there's challenges and there's drama. And I, I just love that whole part of it. And that's, you know, certainly something that keeps me up. I, I'm to the point where if I had to give up one or the other racing or announcing in nationals, I would actually give up the competition before I give up the announcing. Oh, wow. So you, because you like telling the stories, do people come to you and, and thank you for it? Like what, what's the, or do you just like being behind the microphone maybe? <laughs> I'm sure there's a bit of ego to it too, but I know what I really like is um, you do the research, you find out what somebody has done to get there and, and you get to the point where now people know that I'm going to announce, they'll start feeding me stories, um, which makes it even more interesting. But even it's just looking at pro and tour results of different players and looking at Rocky's, you know, book and saying, wow, this guy's been out the nationals 19 times. He's trophied 18. That's, that's darn impressive. Let's talk about that. Um, and put that in perspective of how things play out. So as you get to that second day and everyone's fighting for trophies and fighting for jackets, you can tell that story in perspective of who these people are, as opposed to just saying, here's car number X, Y, Z. And, you know, here's the guy or the girl that just won the class. It's, that to me is boring, but getting into why, you know, why was it exciting this year when Sam Strano won SSR? Why was it exciting when Brian Peters won CP? You know, the, it's not just, hey, here's a guy winning another jacket. For Strano, it was, how many years has he been trying to win SSR? Yeah. You know, for Peters, it was, how many different classes can he do this in? Can he beat this perennial champion that wins this class every year in a car that everybody says is potentially even underprepared? It, that's the story. I love that. And... and- yeah, that's neat, and I like what you're. That sets a high bar, also that people announcing should try to do that and get the backstories. I mean, that, those are also. I'm not sure if you, you guys do that, but those are blog posts or anything else that could go up on social media. Just giving some of those stories even ahead of time, if you have some of the stories, uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, and and that's a little bit about what we do. And I I got to give credit to Hayward Wagner. He's the one that really kind of kicked this into the next level. Um, you know, anybody's talked to Hayward, you know that he's. He's a bundle of vision. He just constantly has these ideas of where he wants to go. And when it comes to building brand or building experience, that's his, his will out. And so when he was chief of announcers at National a couple of years ago, he started saying, hey, let's, let's go a little further. He understood the perspective of having the Ustream audience listening in and what it meant to bring the story to them. And then to understand how that also goes to Solo Matters and all the other ways of, of communicating this, this whole event to make people feel like they're a part of it. You think about it from his perspective, it was um, to promote the brand of the SECA and Solo National as a brand. If you can tell such a great story and make this, it, express what this event really is for those of us that were there, you know, 1,200 people that were there, maybe the 1,000 people at home who haven't been might get the urge to come back next year. Yeah, and good so you point. have to tell that story and make it interesting. Get it to 2,000, 1,500, 1,700, then 2,000 people. That's one thing I actually think of. I'm like, if we get better and better at the marketing side, at some point they probably will really actually, I may even capped it this year, but it's, I know locally a lot of us want to grow our local ones more. And then you're like, wow, if it keeps growing, can we still do pro solos? <laughs> There's all these, all these ramifications to growing things. But yeah, good point that that all does help. It, it does. It does. And, you know, I think it, it makes a difference to those guys. And I, I think back to in 1997 when I got started, 98, coming to my first nationals, how intimidating it was. I had no idea what to expect other than some word of mouth of a couple of people here in Detroit that said, hey, you got to try to, you know, go to nationals. It's kind of fun. But if I had the chance to really listen to somebody telling the story and I could follow what this story was, what the pro solo season was like and what the people are and the players – it would have been a lot more enticing and it would have been a lot more like, okay, I got to be there as opposed to just somebody kind of like dragging me. And I, I made that jump, but I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't, you know, they end up staying in their small pond for whatever reason and don't ever come to nationals. Some people will tell me, well, I don't want to go because I don't want to finish last. I'll tell them where you finish is such a small part of the whole nationals experience. You go for everything else. You go for the talent and tacos. You go for the Wednesday banquet, you know, with, 
who wins the Solo Cup and who wins the, the Driver of Eminence, who wins the Spirit of Solo Award, that's why you go to national. Yeah, there's so much like that. Just the 1,200 or 1,300 people, the cars. I remember seeing all the S2000s and Type R Integras. So by that point, yeah, D, D stock at the time, you'd see oh. 20 or 30 of them or whatever. It's like, wow. Yeah. Standing there in the grid this year of uh, Super Street, and all those GT3s and GT4 Caymans all lined up and get the dollars that are involved. They're going over to SSR and seeing everybody's got a C4, C5 Corvette just you know lined up or a GT3 or a Viper, whatever, and just go, wow, this is really awesome. That you don't get that locally. You get to see this, and then you can start to put the faces with the names, and you realize that what's great about our sport is these – so-called celebrities, these big names, and I'll, I'll throw Sam Strano's name out there. It's probably one of the bigger names of personality. You walk up and you find out that he's the least intimidating guy in the world. You know, he'll help anybody, talk to anybody, but yet he's sitting there with a closet full of jackets as, you know, one of the premier drivers. And that's, that's I think, what's different about our sport is these great drivers are also just great humans, too. Exactly. We're not, we're not getting paid that much in winnings very often. Although, hopefully, <laughs> no. the pro solo they'll bring... Back, I guess the heyday was way back before I started. It's kind of insane how they said how much yeah. money they had in sponsorships, which I know they're working, always working to get back toward that with less classes and such. So, yeah, have you ever done a pro solo or more of pro solos? What's that? Pro solo wise, what, what is your history with pro solo? Yeah, so um, somebody dragged me into pros back in 2000 or 2001. In fact, actually, it might have been 99, if I think about it. Um, First one was in Peru, Indiana. I remember this one only because Rick Cohn, who ran C Street this year, he and I have this this story we always look back on like a war battle story. <clears throat> he was running a brand new 99 Toyota Celica or 2000 Toyota Celica. I'm running my old Nissan. We are paired up Saturday morning, first run. In this Peru course, if you've ever been to Peru, you know, it's just a, basically an airport runway with a couple of, uh, not airport runway, it's an airport uh, a parking pad for bombers. So it's a straight line with a bunch of these, you know, uh, angled square pads off to the side. So it's a straight run down the middle. You turn out, and then you zigzag your way back. Well, the straight run down the middle basically had, like, a huge offset, you know, a three-cone slalom three-quarters of the way down, and in a Celica GT that year, it was pretty much on the rev limiter. And he, luckily, he got a great launch and a great run down on his side because as he threw it into the three-cone slalom, all of a sudden, he was in my lane, Ooh. and we were probably inches away. We both thought we hit. That's how close we got. Um, but we managed to, to not, but now even almost 20 years later, we still you know, reminisce about, about that little. That was sort of my intro to pro, and for some reason, I kept coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody um, that doesn't do them, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I mean, it's, once again, it's kind of good, I guess, if everybody doesn't try it because we, we hit limits of how much time during the day. <laughs> But oh, yeah. I admit that's the addiction I, of all addictions. Yeah, I, I will say this about pros. Is this year especially, I really got into pros. I've done a lot of them over the years. I would run the finale a couple of times. Even 2002, the first year in a cart, I think we ran a couple of pros and I ran the finale and obviously not competitive. But when you're running, the uniqueness about a cart in a pro, it's, it's such a different experience than anything else. Um, and I've driven a, you know, a couple of the cars. I don't think I've ever proed much other than my, my Nissan. But... When the lights come down and you're doing 60 foot in 1.7 seconds and you're, you're shifting to fifth gear before you probably even turn the wheel, it's, it's an exhilaration, it's an adrenaline rush that you just don't get in anybody else's car. Um, and again, it goes back to Paul Russell's comment about carts have ruined everything else for them because the pros are just so exciting in a cart, even if you're dead last, to launch a cart with the hand clutch, with the smoke coming out, the noises. It's just an incredible sensation, so you just want to keep doing it. Oh, who, who's going to borrow a cart? Actually, I know some people with carts. I could probably borrow all I want. <laughs> I'll get you in one. Uh, you got to talk to Harrington. you got the same height. I think you and Harrington could hook up, and uh, you can run his cart. Yeah, where does he live? <laughs> where, where Tom? Where is Tom? He's live? in Texas. Yeah, he's in Texas. He'll be probably the Mineral Wells or something. I don't know. He'll be at Spring Nationals for sure. Oh, exactly. I, I need excuses to get back to Texas. I keep saying I'm going to go there monthly. I'm now like, okay, maybe every other month I'll get down there. I, so having family down there, I really do. I've been trying to make a point to get back there more often. Yeah. So take us through yeah. what you do for course walks and has that changed over the years? What are you taking in? How many are you doing? What are you gleaning from it? 
Yeah, you know, it, it probably has changed a little bit, um, and maybe not always for the good. You know, I go back to those days of running all those divisional events, those two-day weekends, and I was still even in the Nissan before I run on the cart. And one of my buddies actually was uh, Steve Kucher, a um, good friend of mine. He actually developed the My Auto Events website that a lot of local clubs have used. And um, he and I weren't even in the same car. He was in a Nissan, or I was in a Nissan, he was in his Neon. And we would room together at all these hotels at all these different events. And what we would do is we'd go walk the course Friday night, like a tour or whatever, and then we would sit in a hotel room and we would draw the course maps and we would analyze, you know, on the course map, sort of like the Evo school thing. We would do that every before every course. And it taught me a lot about breaking down courses and understanding line and where to look and all those important elements you want to focus on. At some point I stopped doing that. Um, I kind of got a little lazy. Um, and I, I felt like you know, I was relying too much on instinct and not enough on the real analysis of where you need to go. And I, I might walk a course and try and remember things, but until I really get that activity of seeing the map, you know, the, the thousand foot view of the map, where, you know, really drawing the lines and really kind of lays out what you want to be doing. If I don't do that, I find I make a lot more mistakes. So even la last year at nationals, I, I didn't do enough of that. And I had to go back and watch the video. It's hard for me to watch because I start to see mistakes that I shouldn't have been making. Um, and so that's somewhere I'm going to have to make that. That's my next area I want to improve on is, getting into really reading the courses in a way that um, I can soak it in through a map, drawing it, <clears throat> and paying attention to those things that don't become gotchas, for, even for somebody that's you know, been doing this 20 years or whatever, that they're always still there if you don't keep working on that skill. That's interesting also that you bring up, you'd go back and draw them out and draw the lines. That, that might be very helpful for people. I know I did lots of course design for many, many years. Drawing lines, and when I'm walking courses, I try to picture lines on the ground of what I think the arc is that I'm going to travel through things. So that might be a shortcut that if you don't have the time, and maybe you already do that, if, if I'm not back there drawing it like you would be, I'm at least when I'm walking, yeah. trying to do that. And actually when I drive, I try to see that even colored, like, oh, braking, blending braking. That's kind of one of the things I, I really try to do while course walking. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I, I think anybody would do that. If you're not drawing it, anytime you're walking, you're thinking about like the the... Um, the fictitious line drawn on the pavement of where you might want to be. And so when you get there at speed, you feel like you've been there and your visuals all line up to where your original marks were. What I find on the paper that does for me is it puts things a little bit better in perspective, especially with like varying arcs. Um, I mean, slaloms to me are slaloms, you know, if you, especially in a cart, when you get good at them, you don't always lose that. And a lot of elements end up being some sort of variation on slalom. To me, where I struggle is that varying arc, especially a decreasing radius, to understand and to comprehend exactly how much is it decreasing. Um, I look at um, this year's west course, the corn side, and you get to the, the far, I guess it would be the southwest corner of it, and you're making this big bend left, and you got to come through this chute back up the middle. And it caught me because it, I couldn't find the right point to actually get that uh, bit of trail break and to get the front end to tuck in where I needed it to. And it goes back to, I don't think I drew the map well enough to know when I needed to predict that event. You know, I listen to your podcast from some of the other guys, and a lot of people have the same philosophy as far as, you know, some, some do a couple walks to figure it out and just want to be able to read it. Some want to do 20 or 30 walks. I just feel like I don't know that I've got in me to, to get a great run of nationals unless I really can put it on paper to see that, that arc on paper and then in my mind make the note, okay, that means when I go out and walk the next morning, I have to consciously say, this is the point where that arc, arc had better be tightening or I'm going to miss the late apex I want. So when you say drawing these things, are you drawing the course out from memory? Are you right, walking around, drawing it out, and then going back and putting in the lines? What, what does that mean? When, you know, at Nationals, at least you get the paper course maps, yeah. or at least we did, I guess. Um, you take that paper course map, and that's a great way because they're, they're accurate to scale as, as much as anybody can be. That's a great tool for national. Um, you go back in the old days, and again, back in the early 2000s, even the divisional events here in the Great Lakes and Central Division, some of the events, they used to give those course maps out too. They kind of treated them like national tours, so that's where it started from. They give you course maps Friday night. Um, if I don't have one of those, I probably won't draw it unless there's a couple of features that really are, if there's a sequence, something like, uh, I think about the Toledo tour this past summer, there was a sequence where you had this sort of like a uh, couple of 90s with a 
four cone slalom down the center of between these two 90s. It was kind of tough to figure out where you want to come in and out. I might draw that segment on paper and then back it out from where I want to finish this element. How am I going to make sure I exit the slalom and enter the slalom and going backwards all the way to the preceding 90? Seeing it on paper helps me the most than standing there on pavement and trying to figure it out just looking you know, horizontally across the cone. Okay, yeah. And that's where even doing course design, I would a lot of times draw the lines I wanted and then add cones mm -hmm. back in to hopefully force people to drive this arc that I drew connected to this arc and put cones in there. So that's what I really thought of when you said them. I'm like, oh, yeah. I, I know arcs, mm -hmm. per se, from drawing, doing course design, do that. I, get, I mean, I've taken some of those maps and done some of those things, especially noting to myself, like, I put a big arc, like, I want to get over here, like, make sure you get over there. So how, how many times do you walk in the course, and are you picking key cones in addition to kind of going back and drawing? Because obviously you're keying in on some things of which ones you really want to focus on for the arcs. Yeah, definitely key things that I'm, me, I would say it's the visuals. It's the which cone do I want to be looking at when I'm at a particular position on the course. That's what I'm, all, I'm not necessarily saying whether I want to be backside, whatever. I want to make sure that if I'm in this position that my eyes are on that next cone because that's, that's the key to me because I always have said that your hands will follow whatever your eyes tell them to do. Um, and so if you just always keep the visuals right, everything else typically gets there. So when I, I come out to, let's say, Nationals, and I'll probably walk each course once, twice the first night, go back and study the map. And if I'm not running Tuesday, if I'm running Thursday, Friday, I might walk maybe another, you know, one or twice each day. If you're running that Tuesday and you're starting walks on Monday, probably getting maybe four or five walks in before the start of competition. And if I've got an afternoon heat, I'll probably get another one then at that, uh, that shutdown break um, just to kind of see the line, make sure that I'm not too far off when I thought of. So in that respect, maybe six, seven times in that range. And what are you doing local-wise? Uh, <laughs> once, maybe. <laughs> Sometimes none. Um, and that's... You know, I run uh, locally with the Saginaw Valley region, um, and we're a fairly small club. I think our entire en enrollment of the club is about 100 members. Our solo events vary between 25 and 50 cars. Um, so between myself and basically a core of people like, you know, Dave and Laurie and Finer, you know, Kyle Chips, Sean Tate, and there's a whole group of us that basically are the ones that put on these events. Um, so... Somebody's going to go out and set the course up with maybe two people. Someone else is going to work on something. And you, like anybody who's an event administrator, you run out of time <laughs> to really get much walks in for yourself. So I'll try to get one in, especially if I've got my kids. You know, they're growing up now. They can do it. But especially my, my daughter now, jumping from junior carts into shifter carts next year, she really wants me to walk with her just to kind of reinforce maybe what she saw by herself. So that's usually a lot of times my chance to see it for myself. Okay. Yep. And I'm very similar. I almost pride myself on trying not to walk to make myself look ahead because I think, as you mm -hmm. said, getting the visuals right, everything else falls in place. That, that to me, is the biggest thing, at least for my – some of us are different, but for me, that's the biggest key there is. Yeah, and the other thing about local events, especially when you're only having 25 to 50 cars, we might only give – we might get five or six runs. And, you know, for those of us who go to nationals only getting three, your first one's got to be a pretty darn good run. You get six runs, and I can kind of work on it a little bit. I can go out and lay one down as a recon run and then build and build and build, which is good if you're working on your pro solo strategy and you're working to try and win pro solos. But if you're trying to win nationals, it actually works against you because you lose that discipline of hitting the ground running with a perfect run on the first one. Yeah, and that's funny you bring that up. I've debated that so much. I seem to set myself up for pro solo. I mean, I can be quick sometimes out of the box, but... It's almost like since I skip tours usually, I'm almost only practicing for pro solo type events, which is fun, but it's, it's only funny. half of the battle in my mind of getting championships. Yeah, it's funny to that regard. This year especially, um, I really focus on trying to win the pro series. Had never won nationals or pro. I'd won pro events, but never won the finale. Uh, in fact, I don't think I'd ever even made the challenge at the finale. And so I focused on it this year. Every event, every pro I went to, I kept, you know, focusing on improvement. So that Saturday morning to Saturday afternoon, Saturday afternoon to Sunday morning, and even Sunday morning into the challenge, where can I find time? 
And it's a very different mentality than the three-run nationals. At least it was for me. Um, three-run nationals, you've got to have a really decent plan on your first run, and you've got to be good enough to make an adjustment without seeing another course walk or sometimes even without seeing much for video because you only have a couple minutes between runs. And I did well, actually, the first time I actually won the Pro Series this year. And still part of it was because I was able to make those improvements Sunday morning, and I was confident enough in myself to know that I could do it. I got to national, the actual competition, then later in the week, and all of a sudden, after three runs, I felt like, oh, I really needed maybe two more to figure out what I wanted to do, and it kind of worked against me. And that, I'll, the quote I've, been, I've said to a lot of people is, I really hate national tours. I hate the three-run format. I do it for nationals because it's nationals. Um, may have worked against me. So if I want to really stay with the pack and cart mod, I've really got to work, I think, on that three-run philosophy. And I actually, I, I'm going to go to spring nationals. I'm actually going to stay for the tour. Most years I skip out. I'm going to stay this time. I'm going to hit more tours. I'm really going to focus on trying that and challenge myself to improve that area of my game. Well, congrats on the pro win. I, I need to be your partner in crime, your accountability partner there. I need to do the same thing. So often I leave. This last year I left again. I got the message, hey, you can come drive my Corvette again. I'm like, I'm in Denver. You left? I'm like, yeah, I left. Usually I leave and skip out on that. I mean, it just, I got to change the mindset of the extra six runs is worth it. You're on the surface. That's, it's four nationals. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, I stayed two years ago. I stayed, and I was miserable for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, it's, you you don't want to cost too much work time when you're trying to do a, a real job. You know, and you, you leave work at you know six on Wednesday, and you drive through the night to get to halfway to Lincoln. You do all these things to get there for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday format. By the time I got to Monday or Sunday even, I was exhausted just from the pro, and I didn't want to do it. And all these other factors, I was so miserable. And looking back, I said I shouldn't have, shouldn't have stayed. Well, now I'm thinking I'm going to force myself to stay, but I'm going to find a way to pace myself to make sure that I'm ready for the tour format on Sunday, Monday. Um, it plays a lot into the, building the strength of the tour format, using the concrete and Lincoln for what it is and the advantage of getting seat time on it, um, the other side of it, for me, it goes back to the physical fitness side, is testing endurance. Um, how well can I drive on days three and four after an exhausting couple of days and everything? Can I test that? And that's, you know, can I stay in well enough shape that I can meet it? And then also can I get used to Saturday, Sunday, pro, Monday, or I guess Friday, Saturday, pro, Sunday, Monday tour. It is it's enduring that um, you got to set up for because it pays off when you get to Lincoln. If you're running Thursday, Friday at Nationals in September, and you've been there since Friday before for the pro finale, you have better paced yourself and, and be physically prepared to be you know, alert and uh, physically well enough on Thursday, Friday to do well. I was going to try to resist bringing that up, but at times, <laughs> if I'm there for the pro, and have they ever been Thursday, Friday, whatever, when you're there for nine days, I've stick around all nine days and been fried, totally fried by the time Nationals yep. came up, and just the chances of me having anything to win – not so good. Finishing in the trophies, okay, but just spent. So I've had to either I drive back home seven hours and stay here for even two nights, or I don't let myself stay outside all day long. Because it, it can just be, yeah. too, I feel like it just fries me. I, I can do nothing. I can just walk around, talk to people, and be like, I'm kind of fried. And, and I'm not sure if it's an but age that, thing. I really don't think it is. I think it's just so much time out there. And like you're saying with the spring nationals, even that being that much going on kind of helps you get in the rhythm and maybe build the tolerance to be able to do that. Yeah, it, it, because it does. It's a, it's a lot to just get used to and understanding how to pace yourself. You know, if it's your first national, I tell anybody, don't hold back. Don't worry about winning. Go for the experience. You know, do the, go to the karaoke with Ryan Lauer and Danny K.O. on one night and, and do the every single night event, whatever it is, soak it all in. But when you've been there 15, 16 times, you're trying to win, don't expect that you can keep doing that. You've got to get to bed, you know, 9 o'clock. You've got to get sleep. You've got to discipline yourself to stay out of the sun in the hot days and really pace yourself um, because it'll take a toll. Yeah, very good. i got to get now people on that, that can party all night and still do that. Uh, that used to work for me. I've not tried that in over a decade. <laughs> Let's stay up and be brain dead and drive fast. And if, if we end up third or second this year, and we do all this right, maybe the next time at Spring Nats, we'll, we'll, if you drink alcohol, we'll have a drink or something. We'll take a shot and say, hey, there, <laughs> we'll try something different. Yeah, it's, uh, 
definitely, I, I've seen people pull that off and they'll come out hungover, you know, on day one or day two of nationals and, and make it work. I have no idea how I would be a wreck. <laughs> I, 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 I'm so now such an old man that I need my sleep or I just can't perform. And then the other side, I talked about it, the announcing side, that is, it's turned into a lot, especially for a lead announce. And so, you know, people that go to nationals and you know the names like Andy Hollis and Ron Bauer and, um, and, and uh, Sam Carp, but these guys are lead announcers. They're not just announcing for one heat and two classes. These guys, and myself included, we're responsible for the entire day of heats on one whole course, cool. and then the second day on the other course. So, you know, I know Sam Carp, he's, he and I have compared notes. It's exhausting to get out there at 630 in the morning, do that warm-up show before competition starts, and announce your own heat, and be there to support the other announcers in case something fails or whatever. It's a long day. Um, if you don't get the sleep and the rest, it's just brutal. But, as I mentioned earlier, part of the reason why you do it is because of the love of actually doing it and being a part of the whole experience. You just got to make sure you balance that with a little bit of sleep and a little rest um, if you're going to play all that together. Exactly. And that's where I'm thinking, got to have some more people help you out there so you don't have to do as much. You don't feel obligated to do as much to have it as, as great as it is. Yeah, that, that's hard for me. I'm, I'm a very... You know, like I mentioned, I'm an energy person. I like to be a part of it. It's hard for me to sit back. I'll, I'll sit there and listen to the other announcers that are on my course in that day. I'll just sit and grid. I'll walk around and talk to people. And if I somebody says something interesting and grid, I'll go walk up to the announcer in the car and just say, hey, I just talked to so-and-so. Here's a great story. Feel free to use it. Or if that guy in the announce car needs a bottle of water, I'll get a bottle of water, and then I'll you know, do like a pit reporting while he drinks his water. I just love doing that so much. It's, it's hard to pull away and not be – right up there with it. it it's really, like I mentioned earlier, it's one of the real enjoyments I get out of the sport. Yeah, no kidding. So breaking into the mental game, do you have any anything you can share there, either between runs or things you've done over the years on the mental side? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, um, I, I look at myself as something fairly analytical. Um, I do try to address all those areas, you know, physical side, the, the vehicle prep, the setup, and all the preparation, but at the same time, there is a bit of a mental side. It, sometimes it's, it's very rhythmic for me. Um, it's knowing i got to get into this particular mindset if I'm running third heat on Thursday at Nationals, i got to make sure I'm getting the right sleep the night before, getting into that rhythm of the cup of coffee in the morning, the breakfast, getting into all those steps. So in my mind, I'm preparing in into my plan. Um, Getting into the vehicle, it's a bit of the um, try and block everything else out. Um, try to visor shut, you know, just focus on the first couple of corners and try and um, block any distractions out. Don't overthink, but don't underthink. Um, and there's a balance to that that at times I've struggled with. Um, you know, certainly when you're in a cart, there's so many things that can distract you whether it's the sensations of, you know, two Gs or the acceleration or the, you know, slipping and sliding or the noises or the shifting, you have to find a way to block those out as distractions but listen to them as, as the driver. And that's a very, to me, it's a mental um, preparation to get you to be able to, to tune all that in just right. So when you take your run, you can be thinking ahead without thinking behind. You don't want to be worried about the last, you know, turn in you missed because, as everyone says, it's going to screw up the next one in front of you. That's all mental. Um, and it's, it's a huge part of our game. And I've, our, our game is all mental. What else is it? You know, there's, <laughs> it's set up, but even set up as mental. It's knowing, um, having a confidence that if you come back from a run and you think, oh, i got to make a, a shock change on the, you know, the rear shocks on my Civic, you got to have that understanding of what that's going to do and the confidence that it's going to work for you. So when you get back in, you make it work. But it's funny because probably nine times out of ten, that shock change probably didn't do anything. But mentally, <laughs> it, it gives you the cue that the car handles better. Um, and the same thing in a car, you go and, you know, adjust. I had this rear sway bar piece in my old chassis. I used to adjust all the time. There'd be days that, you know, I'm going to go from full flat to full stiff on this thing. It may not have made much of a difference, but in my head it did, and it gave me that mental confidence to now focus on hitting my marks and not focus on is the vehicle doing what I want it to do? Yeah, it basically gave you the hope. 
And that's where, for me, because I haven't played with the knobs enough, the air pressure would be like, ooh, I need to let like two or three pounds out right there. That's going to make it just stick that much better. It's really the confidence and the hope that, oh, that's, I, yeah, I should have said confidence, that, oh, that little bit's really just going to help me push it over the edge or just get it just right there. So that really is yeah. kind of funny. You have to know what you're comfy with, whereas I had, um, I'm going to call him out, Michael Feldpush, I think it was Packwood. Maybe it was California. Somewhere he is there at the pro. And in the finals, going through the challenge on Sunday, he changes my settings or air pressure or something and doesn't tell me till afterwards. Did he? Yeah. He's like, oh, I could tell I was doing this, so I did this for you. I'm like, good thing I like won and I didn't have to come back and want to like wring your neck. So that's another odd thing is, I, this is a, sub, a side topic almost, but having a co-driver or somebody that's trying to help you out when somebody like me especially doesn't really think, oh, I should do this or do that. That would be very helpful, I think, in a cart if I had somebody else that knew what they were doing and knew what to do. Because somebody did that for me, it obviously didn't hurt me. Because like you're saying, I, I totally believe this. An air pressure, a pound or two here or there, at least in cars, probably makes no difference except for on the confidence side. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned about the co-driver aspect that, you know, had he told you that before you took the run, you probably would have had a terrible run. You would have been upset with him because yep. it would have gotten in your head. Yep. <laughs> but I think what that there's something about co-drivers. I'm sure we could talk for six hours about my personal philosophy about co-drivers that you've really got to get into a rhythm with somebody if you're going to maximize that co-driving experience into success. Um, and I'll give you this example. My son and I, you know, he jumps from junior carts, shifter carts, and 2015, I guess it was, we go all the way to nationals. Um, again, I finished third, shockingly. 2016, he starts college, and um, or in that summertime he was going to, didn't make all the events, did not make it to national or the pro finale. I go out in the pro finale with no co-driver. Suddenly I felt completely lost, like, like somebody cut my left leg off. Um, I, I had some engine power issues to the point where I couldn't even do a burnout in the burnout box, and I just didn't, I didn't even have it in my head straight enough to say, how do I fix this? Where had my son been with me? You know, as my, my longtime co-driver, we would have talked it through it. We would have figured out something to do, and we would have made a decision, fixed it, and it would have worked better. For me, it got in so much into me where I couldn't quite resolve it. I was spending, this was Sunday, the pro finale problems. Monday, I'm in paddock scrambling to try and fix it. I gave up. I did not run the cart in 2016 because I couldn't get the power issue fixed in time, and part of that most of that was because I didn't have a co-driver that year. So it was really hard for me to make that adjustment from someone who's a known co-driver and we've got a great working rhythm to all of a sudden having that gone. Um, and you look at some of the successful co-driving tandems that are out there, um, you know, Signaro and, and Meyer, all these guys, they work together a long time because they know each other. They can, they can do this. Or even, you know, whether Hogan and, and Peters, you know, Peters gets maybe the accolades for winning, but he and co-driver are building cars together, and I, I guarantee you it's because they've got this working relationship that they can build together and they have this rhythm that it works. Um, and I think that that says a lot. You take that co-driver out from someone, and not every driver who's a top one, if you take away their co-driver, they may not have the same success. Oh, I... um, You've got to have yeah, that right rhythm to be able to be successful as the team um, together. And I've, I've had some experiences with newbies that come along, and sometimes it works for me. The year at Condoway Nationals, I had never even met the guy until we got to Lincoln. Um, but it worked that he just clicked and we didn't get in each other's way. He was kind of a newer guy, um, let me do my thing, but he didn't get in the way. And that worked for me. But there's other times where you got somebody who's a really good driver, they come in, all of a sudden you're fighting over what changes to make or who does what, you forget to put numbers on, <laughs> things like this. All that just falls apart. So there's a huge part to success if you're going to be a two-driver team to really knowing and working with that co-driver. No, no kidding. And you make me remember that I almost always had co-drivers. And then one or two years, especially the first time I showed up without one, it was weird. Mm -hmm. Just all, yeah. all of a sudden, all this time, and then one year it's sprinkling, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm a low number. And this is my last run, I don't know if it's day one or day two, and it's sprinkling on my car. I'm like, oh, yeah, I should have had a co-driver again. And just for me, I'm pretty high energy. Having someone to talk to or do something with, I mean, I usually run around the car doing something like, oh, I'll check the tire pressures again or spray something. It, it was just so weird. So that's one thing I'm glad you brought up that if, if you all are used to having, if anybody's used to having a co-driver, 
show up at Nationals with one because otherwise it's going to throw you into some other atmosphere of what is going on here. Am I breathing the right kind of air? It, it was just so weird, like you're yeah. saying. It, it works both ways. You know, I know a lot of guys will be single drivers all year long, but to help expense at the Nationals, they bring a co-driver. It blows the rhythm again yep. in the opposite way. Now all of a sudden you're doubling up on your, how fast you're doing runs. You've got to really watch tire pressures. You really got to make sure numbers, something as simple as swapping numbers you don't do by yourself that now you got to take it into account. You know, so when this, this past 2017, after doing all the years with co-drivers, every year nationals, I'd never, 15 years, I'd never gone without a co-driver. Even in 2016, I jumped into somebody else's car in class. So this year, 2017, I knew that I wasn't going to have a co-driver. My son was not going to make it. So as it went through the season, I started sort of practicing being on my own, going to a couple of events, getting used to that feeling. So when I sh showed up in grid day one of my two days of nationals, I had a better sense of what to do. I still felt a little lost in that idea you mentioned about not having the co-driver and kind of being bored between runs without having someone to talk to. It definitely was there. At least I kind of mentally prepared myself for it. And I, I would use that time because now instead of having six minutes, you've got 15, 20, 25 minutes. I'd go talk to the other single drivers in grid and see how they're like Tom Harrington's a guy. You know, I walk over to Tom, hey, what are you working on? What, are you, what parts are you throwing at it? And sort of do that bouncing ideas off with him. It helps him a little bit, but it helps me too. Um, and I, it, it's part of that two-driver rhythm that if you don't have one all of a sudden, you've got to be ready for that because it's a very different experience. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you were smart to say, hey, if I'm not going to have a co-driver, get used to it now. And I like that if you don't have one, go talk to other single drivers. Like That probably never even entered my mind to go dare bug some because uh, I think I'd be bugging somebody else. But, yeah, people do. <laughs> you can talk to other people more if you don't have a co-driver and then somebody else there as well as a support team. It's so weird. I'm like, I'm by myself. And other people kind of help me keep my head screwed on. Or, hey, you should check the gas. Yeah. Or you should do something that you didn't think to do. <laughs> sure. And, you know, and there's, you got to obviously be able to read people. You don't walk up to the guy who clearly doesn't want to talk to anybody, yeah. who's got rent throwing miles around. But there are some people you can walk up to and get that rhythm going. And, and it helps. Um, sometimes you can, somebody's a bundle of nerves is the first nationals. You go up and talk to them. Maybe you can, you know, break dice a little bit, um, or maybe they're in the same boat you are, and you want they want somebody they can um, bench race with for a minute, talk about what the concept of the course is, what they're doing. Um, so you can kind of work on. But obviously, you don't want to you don't want to pick the wrong person to have a conversation with when they're in their own head and just don't want to be heard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that's a good point for everybody. You'll see people. I think of Andy Hollis, and I watch these people that are fast, and I'll be sitting there and obviously focusing or going through the course. I try to pay attention to other people and be around them that they're fast. It can be Sam Strand or whoever, or they can be in your class or in other classes. I try to watch them and see what they're doing. I'm not necessarily bugging them or asking them questions, especially if it's during runs. But if they're walking course and they're talking to anybody else, I will try to listen in. I've always done that with yeah. the past people. David Falf, he was the guy. I was the puppy. Like, hey, you're my owner. What are you saying now? That's great. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because you know, one of the things I go back to the announcing gig is, that Hayward Wagner put in place was the idea of having a real pit reporter. And typically this would be an announcer who's in his, uh, they would make us work two heats, one for lead announce on the mic, one as a pit reporter. And I had the opportunity to be pit reporter for, you know, my courses while I got somebody else in the car. I think for three straight years, I was pit reporter for Street Mod Front Wheel Drive. I, it was funny because the first year, I kind of looked at some guys that I bet these guys will talk to me. And then I ended up going back year after year I'd put myself right between Andy Hollis and James Jordan because they're typically gridded next to each other, and neither one of them would ever shut up once you get on talking. It's great. Um, and they, it was fun. The first time I'd gone up to Jinx in the first year I was pit reporting, and he didn't know who I was, and I asked him a couple of questions. Hey, what are you working on? He's like, well, Fred's feeling this, and we're going to do this change to the rear, whatever, whatever. And he said, five minutes later, he heard somebody saying those words over the loudspeakers. He put it together that I was actually – doing pit reporting. So when I went back to him, he goes, you're taking this up there, aren't you? Goes, yeah. He said, all right, well, let me give you the real story then. And he, and he starts talking for 10 minutes. And it's great. If you find the right people, and Andy and Jenks are, are two of them, they'll talk your ear off, even in the middle of their competition runs. I mean, there's some point where they're going to put their helmet on, you walk away and let them go. But there's guys that will just come up and talk. And then there's other people that will look at you and say, don't come near me. Yeah. Um, and once you remember – and it's funny to see people grow and mature in the sport was um, uh, Tamara Hunt. <clears throat> when she first came to the Nationals driving the, the Davis CSP car, 
and she destroyed CSP ladies. I mean, it was, you know, and it's some really good drivers in CSP ladies. There's, there's no slouches there. Tamara comes in as a rookie. Nobody expected. She just checks out. I was walking up to her and saying, do you want to talk? And she would just look at me and just shake her head, wouldn't even say a word. Fast forward four years later, you can't get her to stop talking. You, this year she ran open DSP. In fact, almost won. She had the lead after two and a half runs the class. I was there with her, and she was chatty, telling me about it. So there's, you know, certain people will eventually open up, but you've got to be able to read them so you don't grab the wrong person at the wrong time and get in their head. But there's a lot of great people that will just – Tell you what's going on, even though, in the middle of the heat of the battle. Yeah, especially the pit reporter. That's fun. I keep thinking I'm going to take a mic and record more stuff. That's a great idea to go around. Hey, you want to say something? How's it going? What, what, what's the latest? What, what are you, what are you gonna how are you going to attack this run? That that would yeah, be fun on too. The spot, reporting yeah, basically. Your, right there. The and there, and yeah. you guys can obviously broadcast it out, but or you can then go back and talk about it. So that, that's a, a nice little yeah. additive thing you can do there. Yeah, we can talk about it. We collect those stories. The elite announcer can use it, or sometimes a pit reporter can get on the mic and talk about it. And, and again, going back to building that story for the people watching or even the people right there, um, it also is great for stories at the banquet. Um, oh, you go back to two years ago, it, us as lead announcers, we, we now present all the heats from the classes, the ones that are on our day. So I get to collect all these different stories. Um, and the one I remember and I, I, at the time, Sam Strano was not happy, but this was, I think, three years ago. Um, first day, something happens with the car, and it goes into dead mode, right? And can't get the car to even turn over, whatever. Somebody's grabbing a jump box to it. Um, you know, his, his co-driver, Mike's trying to, get, trying to get his run started, then Sam can get his, and tensions are high. And, you know, Sam's an emotional guy, and it's, it's amazing how fast he can drive because sometimes he looks so stressed um, that he can overcome that. But that day, he was particularly stressed, and I was – announcing for them at the time and he basically just did not want to even talk about it he said it was one of the most stressful moments ever but when we got to the banquet <laughs> and now he's finished i think he was uh that might have been the year he was second uh, to grant reeve by four thousand or whatever the number was ridiculously small number and, but i was able to then use that as a great story as he's coming on stage in second to say hey overcoming a car that wouldn't even start before his first run and still be able to come in, you know, second in that field is a lot about a guy. He'd be able to shake that on his nerves. So those kind of stories are great if you can find them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you're saying, you get to then at the banquet bring that up. So you've already yeah. given us some nice stories. What is your, like, favorite memory, if you can pick one or even two, in autocross, your career? <laughs> um, probably quite a few. I think, uh, you know, that... The, the 2012 Nationals, my second year after taking a couple of years off, um, after two runs first day, I was down probably 10th spot. I'm like uh, a second back of where Russell's last run was, and I'm a second driver saying, I just got to get something close. And I go out and I lay this run down, and I think that's, I, I think Russell's time was something like, a, let's say it's a 54-5. <clears throat> and I look on my – I think I was running like a 55-9 at the time. And I look on my sheet, and it says like it – it says like 55-2, and I'm like, oh, all right, no big deal. I looked again, it said 54-2. And that moment of kind of like realizing, wait a second, I think I actually just put a pretty – it didn't even click in me. I, I was just more like not even thinking that actually that was a hell of a run, probably one of the best runs I ever had looking back. Didn't even realize it looking at the time slip the person gave me that I actually had the lead. And by the time I get up to the scales and putting this all together, I've got three or four guys coming on and going, holy crap, where did that come from? What did you do? Um, it was one of those moments you just go, what the heck did I just do? Um, you know, it just kind of scared myself a little bit, but it was um, probably pretty exciting. Um, the other one is, uh, as a parent, when your kid has some steps or something clicks in one of your kids, especially whatever they're doing, um, you have that moment of, of pride. Toledo Pro Solo in 2015 uh, that was this legendary pro where it rained so bad. There's pictures out there of just the floods across Toledo's airport. And they only ran a morning heat. We finished the morning heat at like four, 3 in the afternoon, and they canceled the afternoon heat because it was just nothing but torrential downpours. We ran in that rain, and it was brutal. And I ended up – it was a lead after the afternoon, but who cared, right? It didn't really matter. Sunday morning, they gave us six runs instead of four to make up for losing the heat in the afternoon. And I was, I was first driver out. I go put my runs down, and I'm thinking, 
I've got this. I'm just going to get to the challenge. No big deal. Maybe my son will get close. If I'm lucky, maybe he'll finish second. His third run, he took the lead. Oh, wow. And it was, yeah, it was one of those moments you go, holy crap, something just clicked in this kid where he just figured it out. Um, you know, and at that point, I'm like, it, he didn't even need six runs. It was three, and it was over. Um, so that's, that's where you kind of go, there's a memorable moment when – a year and a half of him adjusting to the shifter and building and building, all of a sudden it clicked um, that he was ho- totally in tune with that card in that moment. It was really, really a neat moment. And, and during your run that was so fast, it's funny, I honestly usually forget the seconds. I just look at the tenths, or I mean, the, after the decimal point. So very often people ask me what a yeah. run. I could, I could see myself doing that, finishing and not realizing the second was good or bad or, or faster. What did that feel like? Did it just feel like a good run? And you just thought, hey, I was trying to get in there. Do you think you were relaxed? How did, how did that? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you know, I had taken the first two runs. I, this is five years ago now, but I still remember. I took the first two runs, and I wasn't hitting the mark exactly like I wanted, but I was close. At least I thought I was close. And I thought, okay, if I can fix these marks, I think I can get close. Maybe I'll be a half a second back from Russell. I think JT McClintock was in there. There's a few others in that mix. I said, oh, man, if I could just fix these marks, I'll be good leave the line, hit the first little turnaround, come around to this next tank. Like, okay, that, that felt like a, that's what I wanted to do. And just kept not even thinking about whether it was a great run, just thinking about the next mark I wanted to hit. And so when the time came up, I thought, okay, I did what I wanted. I hit the marks. I found seven tenths, and that's what I wanted. I didn't realize I found like you know, one and a half seconds because hitting the marks was such a leap. And I go back and watch video. This was West Course 2012. And it was the first year where they started, I think it was, uh, it was the Hollis or was it Roger, but they had the eyebrows. Remember the, uh, eyebrow, the first yeah. year, the eyebrows? Yep, yep. It was that close. And I only remember that because I've watched the video. I go back. It had this, like, almost dig you had to go through, this right-hand kink dig, and then you make this left into the first eyebrow. But on my second run to my third run, I gained a full second just through the eyebrows didn't even realize it until I went back and watched video and started syncing up and realized that I hit the dig so well and hit the turn-in mark entering the first eyebrow, and then I was perfectly tight through the other eyebrows, and it made such a difference. In my mind driving, I was just like, okay, that worked. That's kind of what I wanted to do, and just kept driving. Uh, yeah, you didn't back, get caught up on that. was really good. I, I've done that before, um, and then hit a cone or done something else stupid, but yeah, you just you, right. knew you hit it, and you went ahead and loaded the next part of the course or keep looking ahead. Right, and that's part of the mental game that we have. Is if if you do that to yourself, if you find if you pat yourself on the back while you're going 50 miles an hour sideways because you did the last corner great, you're gonna screw the next ones up. And I'm, you know, I've tried to remind myself of that because there's everybody does it, right? You'll hit this slalom just perfectly, man, that was great, and then you miss the breaking point for the next one. Um, <laughs> it's just you have to constantly keep that in check of just next mark, the next mark, the next mark. And then do your mental review after you get to the finish lights. When you get back to grid, think about it then, but you've got to somehow force yourself to not try and think about how well you just drove. You've got to always think about how well you can hit the next mark. Yeah, uh, and that's where I love the challenge. It was Leslie Cohen written up in Sports Car, I think. She talked about, hey, can I focus for 60 seconds? And that really stuck with me. I'm like, can I seriously, Kinch, can you seriously focus for 60 seconds? <laughs> Because at times I've celebrated and hit cones and thrown away a pro solo championship and celebrate, like picked my hand up on the car and said, yes, and then done something stupid. And I'm like, you're still driving. So it's like self-discipline even. I, that's the biggest challenge of all is can I get the best out of me? Whether I win or not, it's really now can I get the best effort out of me? Can I do the prep work? Can I put in the practice time? Can I show up and be, be there in the moment and stay there looking ahead? Yeah, so it's funny about that because, I, you know, I tell the story there about how the West Course, my day one, went. I had this lead, and I was just, after the whole thing was over, I was ecstatic that I had been able to, to be in that position. And then going over to the East Course, of course, the next day, and you get all that, that, that challenge of, you know, put it behind you, go learn the course, do your thing. It's a hot day. It's 90 degrees. We're running fourth heat, and it's just brutal. I'm, and I'm in the grid spot all the way next to the airport runway and the end of the course of course is all the way down there in the center of the of the site so you got all these things going on my co-driver goes out in his first run gets red flagged because somebody hit a cone whatever dnf in front of him he comes back in gets his rerun on the five minute clock goes out 
gets red flagged again on the rerun. I don't even have a run yet. I'm in the lead after day one. I don't even have a run yet. The entire field's gone, and they're basically waiting for me to take a run. I go take my run. I come back. I'm in third or whatever. Second run. I'm still behind. These guys are on stopwatches now between my co-driver and I, and I'm trying to shake this. Again, I had, did so well on day one. Now I'm trying to back it up day two. We get to my co-driver's third run basically happened in the middle of the second drivers of everybody else. They are holding the entire heat for me. Oh. And in my head, I've gone through mentally. I didn't have any video at the time um, that I was watching. I recorded didn't watch. In my mind, I knew which marks I wanted to hit. And the course basically, you know, facing south, makes a left, towards the runway, makes a double apex right, comes back to the middle. I had totally screwed that up my second run. I said to myself, all i got to do is hit those marks, and the rest of the course will be fine. It's a lot of time I screwed up there. I think I can do this. Well, I leave the line. Again, the whole drama in front of me, how much I love the storytelling. The drama in front of me, I take off, get a good launch, make the double apex absolutely perfect. I am heading back to center site, make the left kink that enters the six cone slalom, and for the fraction of a moment, I took my eyes off of where they needed to be. And by the time I f focused on and figured out which cone I should be looking at, I was hitting the first cone of the slalom. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. And the rest of the slalom, and I have this on helmet scan video, I am pounding the steering wheel with one hand and then shifting and then hitting the steering wheel again and then shifting. Finished the run, would have won, except for the dumb cone, and it was because I lost focus because I was thinking to myself how great I had hit the marks that I wanted to hit. Whereas the day before, I had hit the marks and didn't think about it. I just I let it slip for that one little moment. You know, and that's, that's all it takes. Yeah, I, I, it's so true. Can, can we keep the focus and not have the early celebration? Actually, this year at Nationals on the West Course, you had to come around that big, huge sweeper before the finish. And I'm like, this is good. This has been great. And I'm off that next cone on the left that sets you up for the really fast. And I'm just, I'm probably screaming. Yeah. I'm probably like just at that point screaming, knowing hey, you just blew it. You just, you had the magical second run or whatever, and you blew it. And that's why I think the mental side, once you get decently good at this, it comes down to the mental side. And maybe for you and I, at times, it's just the focus all the way through, which I haven't thought about as much, except that talking to you really has helped me realize, yeah, no kidding. Just focus once again on the actual run the whole time of what's next. And I've had to tell myself that at times, look ahead, what's next, what's next, like that's my mantra, what's next? Yeah. Like keep your head up, what, what yeah. is coming up, because thinking of how good everything was is taking away that little bit of mental power, especially in a cart that you would need. And you made me think, I wonder if I did some carting at all, if it would seem so much slower back in the car, like maybe it would give me too mm -hmm. much time not to focus, but it might be a good training thing for people to get in and get a little bit used to it even if it was a, not a shifter cart, just to be like, oh, okay, a lot going on, I can handle it, now let's slow it back down. It definitely does. There's um, that transition from a cart back to a car, especially if it's in the solo world, because it's still dancing between cones, it's mentally supposed to be the same thing, but doing it in a cart with all those dynamics and shifting, and then getting into a car, which is 10% you know, slower, it just becomes easy. And it, my example is 2016, after I had all those engine issues in the pro finale, I was offered a ride at SSR, which is one of my favorite classes to watch, in the Dodge Viper. And I'd never sat in a Viper, let alone driven one, let alone driven one in anger, you know, on Hoosiers and all that. But once I did, it wasn't hard. I don't want it, it's a Viper, it's somebody else's car and everything, but I wouldn't say it's the hardest thing in the world. Um, it was because everything becomes easier because everything is slowing down for you. You know, I, I did some because I'm a left foot breaker, I was just trying to use too much brakes and all those things. But, I, you know, I, and my technique wasn't perfect, but I also didn't embarrass myself. And I, I was top 10 in FSR, and I'll take that in a heartbeat in that group. Um, wow. In that Viper. Yeah. Jumping it was, in. It, it was, yeah. Jumping into a that. slower vehicle. You'd be like, I, let me get an SSR so I can slow down a little bit. That That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. But you think about what a, and that's why I should buy a C5. Z06 Corvettes are my favorite cars to autocross because, in a way, they're not that different from a cart in a shifter. And how you want to make them move, to me, feels like a, a 3,200-pound or whatever it is cart. It's not that different. The Viper, in a way, wasn't hugely different. It just it was a bit of an understeer to it. You kind of had to manage that a little bit. But, again, all the time you spend focusing on the speed and, and leading the car in the cart, 
getting into the car, you can lead things a lot easier because it just it happens. So you can take care of that understeer a little bit because you have more time to think about it. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, it's so funny, like when Barry Ott, hopefully I haven't said this too many times, he gets in my Integra or whatever, and he's making little bitty inputs like a C-Mod vehicle way back in the day. And I'm like, all the same inputs, just you're not waiting for the thing to roll and set. So I guess that was a big difference for you two. You had to wait for all that weight transfer to actually occur. I, I did. And actually, you know, I had Sam, I mentioned Sam earlier, uh, a guy who was always wanting to offer help. He actually gave me a tip. He, he just happened to be out there watching his co-driver because I was gridded almost right next to him. He's watching, you know, Big Mike running. And he would see my runs, and at the end of the first day, he comes up and he says, hey, by the way, I just so happened to see your runs. I think you were trying to trail brake too hard in this car. You're, you're using too much brake. You're overloading the front end. Back off a little bit. Let the car come to you and let it rotate. I'm like, wow, okay, that's, hey, it's the king. It's Sam. i got to take the advice. <laughs> so the second, yeah, the second day, and I, it was that west course where you had, it was the Marcus Meredith one where you had that six-cone monster slalom or seven or eight, whatever it is, up the middle of the site. Yeah. And... At the end of it, if you remember, you had this giant decreasing radius sort of feature, this, this showcase feature, if you will. I remember getting on that course and getting to that point, and I turned in, and in my head I heard Sam's voice saying, get off of the brakes, let the car work. And I suddenly just almost jumped off the brakes, and the car just beautifully rotated for me. It went from understeering to perfectly neutral with nothing more than lifting the brake. <laughs> and it was that kind of adjustment that I need more time to really – I think the car could be a trophy contender in SSR, but I wasn't going to get it there that day because I couldn't make those subtle adjustments. I mean, you look at the field in SSR. Yeah. Every one of them has been driving those cars forever. You're not going to jump in and, and destroy them. So I was just hoping to just be respectable, um, but it would take another season of figuring out those little subtleties of how you trail brake and how you don't trail brake and how you dynamically get the weight to transfer to then take it to the next level. But you can get 95% of the way there jumping from a cart into one of those. Well, that, that's good to know, too, that it does it can translate. How how hard or how much are you braking versus lifting in a cart? Um, I probably do more braking than even than I should. Um, the cart's interesting because you have so much contact and so much grip relative to the amount of weight of the car that you don't – lifting isn't really the right term. Because you could pitch it sideways and you could take a ton of speed off without your foot ever leaving the gas pedal. So you're, you're managing that speed, the combination of maybe a little lifting the gas, but probably more of a little bit of pitch and then applying brakes. So, like, for example, the, the pro finale course this past year where you had kind of off the start, you know, the typical pro course, a couple of wiggles, it was kind of box-shaped after that. You had these long runs through these pivots. A lot of this was a standard on its nose, get it to rotate somewhat early and then stand it on its gas so you can drive it, you know, through these corners. Um, not really much for lifting. It was more about just throwing it in, a little bit of catching, and then getting on the power so you keep the weight transfer right through the corner. Um, it's a little – it's a different than some other cars because other cars don't have that relative grip to weight that they take that much speed off. Like you always do. You scrub speed if you're sliding. In a car, it's extreme. Um, you start sliding even for a, you know, just a fraction of a moment, you're going to lose a couple tenths of a second because all that speed's gone. And it, carts really are momentum vehicles. It's hard to get that pace back. Um, you have to really maintain it. And so sliding is the way you do it if it's done right. It's a little less than just doing a typical lift the gas pedal like you might in a front drive or a big rear drive car. So I'm thinking when you're saying sliding, you're scrubbing off speed so you're basically doing that instead of what I would do as braking, I guess. You're on, on entry, you're scrubbing off a little bit by with slip angle? You might be a little bit, yeah. Um, for example, like if you go into a slalom and you've got a pretty high entry speed into a slalom, um, in a car, you might just turn in a fraction earlier, just get a little bit more slip angle, which controls that speed, and then you're good for the rest of the slalom. Whereas in a car you're probably going to have to take a pretty big lift, which then gets that suspension change, you know, that weight transfer. In the cart, the weight transfer front to rear isn't as – it's certainly not as – it's very fast. Um, a lift in the uh, throttle doesn't do enough. Um, there's just not enough torque in the motor to be able to, you know, to pull you down in speed or anything. So you've got to use other 
things. You got to use a little bit of brake or you got to use a little bit of slip because the tires themselves sliding sideways will definitely take speed off way faster than just trying to lift the engine. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess smaller engine also, it, you're not going to have that much engine braking, I guess I would, I would categorize it that way. It's just not there. Almost none. Yeah, you can, you can be going 75 miles an hour in sixth gear. You start hitting the brakes and downshifting. You'll stop because of braking long before you'll ever get down to first gear. The, this, um, the engine braking will not pull your speed down significantly. Um, it'll, instead, it over revs. So oh. that's typically how guys, you know, you could stick a motor if you start downshifting from sixth to fourth and you haven't really taken speed off yet. Uh, you could definitely do some damage. Uh, because the engine is not going to bring that power down. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a fascinating little little more tidbit there to consider if you get one of these things. What you're doing, braking, and then braking in the shifting or sliding the cart somewhat, slip angling to slow down. Because that just hit me again. I'm like, oh yeah. Plus you're downshifting anytime you're doing very much of that. Probably if if you slip angle much at all, are you downshifting? Is that like an automatic? Yeah, and that's part of that. Um, um, that's part of that rhythm of understanding and getting used to the experience of the car is knowing when the downshift needs to be done and anticipating rather than, um, than trying to react. If you're reacting after you've done it, you're already too late in something like a car because it just happens too fast. Yeah, you need, you need the power. You need to be back on the gas, not, oh, I'm in the wrong one. i got to shift. That's done. That's probably a tenth or something. Oh, oh you're, uh, if, you, if you realize it and now you're downshifting, you've probably lost a second. <laughs> it's that Oh, yeah. It's that drastic in a cart that if you pitch it sideways, you take a feet off, and then you say, oh, no, I got a downshift, the run's gone. It's got to be anticipation. Everything is anticipation. As soon as you start to move your hands to get that turn in on a fast sweeper, you better be ready already hitting that downshift because it's going to happen that fast. Wow. Mm hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's that challenge, and that's something I, I go back to. You know, I mentioned how I got into the cart thing with, with Alan Scheidler. And he's always said, and he's absolutely right, there's the reason why a lot of us stay in the cart is it could be for Paul Russell saying everything else is ruined. The other part of it is, you know, it's the challenge of getting the golden run. It happens so infrequently that you just are always chasing it. And if you don't get it today, you have this in your mind saying, well, if I, I could just do this better, I could do it tomorrow. If I could do this better, I could do that tomorrow. And you're always challenged because you might get that golden run I'm telling you, in, in 15, 16 years of running shifter carts, um, I've probably had five, maybe seven of those golden runs. It makes That's sense because you, you're shifting, I think you said, what, 28 times in a typical run or something? You've got all that extra yeah, complexity I, there. It, yes, that's a big part of it. And, you know, of course, like the pro finale course, it's fairly simple and straightforward. You're not doing a ton, but there's other times where you're rowing between gears. Um, and just every time you, you're going from fourth to fifth to fourth and all these types of transitional type of things, there's so many places to screw up that you will just, uh, you'll ruin it. Um, you'll lose that run and you, it's hard to get it back. So the challenge is to get that golden run. Um, it, it's hard. <laughs> that, it's really hard. That's why Danny Kao went from golf to doing some karting at some point. It, it's the same thing in golf, except that it's a little easier to get the perfect shot every so often. Sure. Right. It, it's it, it, exactly. It's getting that that hole in one on that you know 110 yard par three that you play every weekend. You might get that hole in one once every five years. It's like that in terms of a golf perspective. It's it's doing everything perfectly, reading the wind, reading the the greens, getting the right you know getting your weedies on that, that morning. All of it comes into play. It's the same thing out across a lot of times like that, but specifically in a cart. To me, the challenge is so hard that. All the planets have to align. If I'm going to get that golden run, I've had a couple, like I mentioned, I had basically won a national in 17 years or whatever, and I've had you know a couple of pros, and I've had a couple of local. It just doesn't happen that often, but you keep chasing it. Aye, aye, aye. All right, some of the wrap-up questions. If you could build yeah. any vehicle, what would you build? Or maybe we just throw a whole bunch of money at Kmon. <clears throat> um... Funny is, I, a lot of people have teased me about it, but I, I haven't really hidden that I'd love to run F mod. Um, I've driven a couple locally. They um, they have the similar dynamics to a cart because of the live axle rear end, uh, and 
they're equally annoying to people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're a lot of fun. But, and, and again, it's cheap. FMOD's probably, to me, the next cheapest thing you can get into in solo. Um, but, to, if, you know, no money. If I was just going to build something, I probably would consider something like B mod um, because you have – it's not – the A mod completely off the chain of everything, but it's still there's a lot to go into it to build it to catch up with, um, you know, the, the guys on the on the West Coast, um, the father son have been running and winning B mod every year, the last few, or trying to keep up in this region area with Clemens Berger. Um, it's not easy. These guys run year after year, to keep going faster, and that that to me would be an interesting challenge on the engineering scale. Can you build and compete with that level and then keep developing to uh, to go further? The only example we've seen lately has been like Dan Fear, with Mark Lamb's help, built that awesome open wheel B mod a couple years back, um, and he actually managed to win one year. But it's it's a challenge to get there, to get the right chassis, to get the because you can do anything you want with suspension pickups. There's such a challenge to get there. The only problem I would face to myself is I don't know that I want to finish mid pack every year. I really like out of the box, pretty close to winning, but there's something about doing it in B-Mod that would be a different challenge. Okay. And you might be the first one that said that. I wish those cars <laughs> are crazy fast. Oh, my goodness. Crazy, crazy. <clears throat> yeah. You get almost A-Mod speed, um, a little less money. Of course, the, the joke within the class is bring money, is that what B-Mod stands for. <laughs> um, but there's some great drivers. There. It's Elam, so the, you know, the, the duo out of the West Coast that run well. Great drivers. I mentioned Clemens and um, and Dan Stone and these other guys, really it, really great drivers in there. So it would be an interesting challenge to be able to, to build something and compete with those guys. But on the simpler side, and again, no secret to anybody, I would love to run SSR full-time. I To go heads up with Reeve and Strano and Luster and, and uh, Matthew Braun and all these guys, to do that every weekend would be so awesome. I would. My, the problem is it goes back to the budget. And I can run so cheap on a cart. I can't run that cheap in a in a Corvette, but I would absolutely love to. I, I hang out with those guys tirelessly. Those guys are they almost look at me like, why haven't you bought a Corvette yet? Um, that I hang out with so much, <laughs> but I really do I love that class. Maybe a co-drive opportunity that got you into this current class will get you into SSR. Maybe. Well, that was the one co-drive I had, and that Viper was SSR, and that was you know one of those where I couldn't turn that down. If somebody handed you the keys to a Viper, and, and Dave Colletti was nice enough to do that, then uh, you don't turn that down. Um, and it was, it was an awesome experience, and I, I would love to do it again. I'd love to do it at the pros, because up here in the upper Midwest, every pro, whether it's Toledo, you know, or when we had Wilmington, it was Luster, Reeve, Strano, uh, Braun, and, and I'm missing a few others. They were there every weekend. And you get to race against those guys every weekend. So you, it's the best of the best. Yep. And I'm hearing rumors that Peters is going to Peters and Hogan are coming back in for uh, this year in a C7. Yeah, yeah. Some so, they, they have one of those in their midst, and a Camaro. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and a Camaro too, right? So, but I think um, I, I get the feeling that Brian likes that challenge too of running with the same for the same reason. Same reason he went to CP with the challenge of building the car, but also the challenge of beating the top level guys they got there with Matt Arash and Meyer. But now coming back to SSR, it's the same thing. Can you, again, he did it two years ago, but can you do it again in a different car with those other guys still there? Um, and I, I get that. I totally understand why that's enticing to anybody. It's certainly at the level of Brian. Like, you know, has nothing to prove, but he certainly wants to keep trying. Oh, exactly. If you're competitive. And believe me, that class. I even asked John Ames last year, hey, do you want some tires and wheels? Do you want to go there? Do you want me to trailer your car somewhere? <laughs> I was like, I would make the jump if I could, especially if you were the right, right person to really challenge me. That would be, it's like a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah. You, know, it, it, you know, it's funny that, that your, your question is typically about you know, what car do you want to drive, class you want to drive. I look at it as I want to drive those classes because the people are there. At the same time, I have, you know, which who do I want to co-drive with? You know, we talked earlier about how important it is, but I'd love to have the experience sometimes of running with a particular person or something for a period of time. Um, you know, and a guy like Strano, of course, because you could just, he just oozes all kinds of knowledge and you could just, you know, take everything from him. Um, I'd love that type of experience. Um, there's a few other folks around, the people that are meticulous about their setup. And, you know, I go back to CP and Meyer and Signaro to run with those guys and how, 
exactly precise they are with their setup. I would love to, to soak all that in to understand how their approach is from run to run and weekend to weekend um, to co-drive with those kind of guys to really get in, in their heads would be really awesome. Yeah, no kidding, Bill. Soak that up. And for me, I'd, I'd want to see if I could, with them changing things, could I feel a difference? That that would be the biggest thing to me is, hey, make a change. Can I feel it? Or they say that it does this. Would I recognize push on entry or something else? That's kind of the next frontier. I'd love to be able to pick up that feel and or be able to notice that. I don't, I don't know how I drive, but I don't really notice it unless the car is so loose that I didn't correct enough for it. It's kind of weird. Obviously, I have feel because I, I can catch the cars as they slide some, but it, it doesn't come across as, oh, I've got mid, mid-corner mid push or something. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because I'm, I'm probably not too different in that regard, too. With the car, I've tried to to get to those points where which knobs do certain things and to tell myself I can feel them. I've done the test and tunes against the clock and done the, the setups and stuff to try and back that up, but still there's it's not, for me, all that natural to – to feel an exact difference of whether it was better or worse, I can almost always manage it. And what I've done to help my setup in that regard is I'll get someone like my son who is more sensitive to setup changes. He'll tell me whether something's better or worse. Or a uh, local guy here run with us at National a couple of times, his name is uh, Christian Hubble. He's been in my car a bunch of times. Great at giving me that feedback to tell me, did the setup change I make really work? Because I'll drive around it. But these yeah. guys won't. It's great to... I, so I'm not that good at either. I have to kind of reach out and use other people to help me set up my vehicle. Where if I have the chance to run with someone like Strano, who does he knows the settings of his car so well, and he, if he were to make a change, he could tell me what the change is, and then he would tell me what to what to expect in the field. And I think, you know, I think there's, I'm sure that you know he, he go drove with Bidenboss this year, and I'm sure John was soaking it all in too to to get to that point where you anticipate a change and then really comprehend what did it really do for you and feel that and to have someone like Sam teach that, uh, yeah, it's invaluable. It is. I, I, I wish I almost want to like, go sleep on his couch at his house, you know, for a couple of months, just kind of soak him. <laughs> go help him, go help him <laughs> ship a few parts and I'll probably let you do that. Like answer the call, exactly, take some yeah. orders. <laughs> we'll go be an intern at Strano Parks for him. <laughs> You're looking for interns, and I get that. You don't pay me. You just let me come and drive your car with you, and everything else is covered. <laughs> uh, you know, with my job, I do all this, this global business all over the world, and I really don't need to be in any one particular location. I could do my job probably from there, and, and I could be an intern for him, too, at the same time. So maybe i gotta, I got to work that one out. <laughs> yeah, possibilities. Yeah, t- If you want to, tell us what you do work-wise. I wish more people would share what they do just so other people know. Sure. I, um, I work for an auto supplier, and after a bunch of years of being an engineer, I moved into our purchasing group for a while and did kind of like a supply chain project management in terms of uh, uh, managing all the suppliers for a particular project. And then about four years ago, I became a program manager for our business level. So basically, the company's name is Yazaki. Not really that important. Nobody ever knows who they are, but we make the wire harnesses in cars. We wow. are the world's big company that makes wire harnesses. Um, I have, my customer happens to be Ford, so I have a couple of car lines that aren't based here in the U.S. that are overseas only that I am managing uh, delivery, quality, um, pre-production development, and that kind of stuff on those types of projects. But I spend a lot of time either on the phone or traveling to and from India, Brazil, China, you know, places like that. Oh, good to know, good so to probably, know. Probably 10 weeks a year or so I spend traveling. In fact, um, this past year... I had to go to Australia for a two-day meeting, and I got I got back from the flight from Australia on the Wednesday before the pro finale, left from my house Thursday morning, and drove to Lincoln Thursday. Oh. But, again, back to that, I've been doing this four years, back to that preparation of, you know, having your setup and getting your night's sleep and eating your dinners. I knew what was required of me to make that trip and come back mentally ready and physically ready. Um, so, again, only through experience able to do that. But that's something I've had to balance. The advantage I have in my job is that I, most for the most part, have flexibility to when all these trips happen. So I can work it around the pro solo <laughs> schedule, the national. But I, I haven't really had to mess anything major so far. So <laughs> I can take this job if I can pick the weekends and the two days around the weekends that I get off to uh, go play in parking lots. 
Yeah, pretty much. There's probably in four years been three times where I've had to get on a plane, either an emergency or I didn't get to pick the trip. The rest of the time I could say, tell you what, I'll be there the third week of September instead of the first week. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like this is, this is an important time for me over here. So is, is there anybody else you'd like to mention or thank? Sponsors, anybody, um, people? You know, I, I, you got to give a little credit to some of the guys around the cart mod group. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned Scyther as kind of being, as a lot of us look at him like the grandfather. Of this. Say that he again. Got, Say the name slowly for me. Oh, uh, Alan Scyther. Okay. Yeah, he, um, you know, he's been in the class since the late 90s when the carts were basically a rental program um, that uh, I can never remember the name of the guy who had coordinated the, through the SEC National Office. It was this big thing. He started out then. Um, Paul Russell started then, and Tom Harrington started then. The rest of us basically latched on to someone like Seidler and all came really from there. Um, big, big part of it. He still he didn't run this year, but he ran the year before. Um, in fact, he comes out once in a while to like a local, and the old guy can still do it. You talk about is there a point physically old enough, can you do it? After seeing Seidler, I'm not sure that that point exists because I would say, you know, not giving away the secrets, I would say he's probably in his mid-60s by now, and he can come out to a local event, and he can be within half a second of me on a day. Um, yeah, so he's, he's a big part of developing the class. And, and you get guys like uh, Mike McClintock that have just made this sport so much fun. You know, you want to talk about an interview, you need to have your you, – you need to do a little post-edit with McClintock to kind of work on his language a little bit. <laughs> but there, there's no one with better stories and has had more fun – uh, around the sport. I've been lucky enough that he's a good friend of mine. We live very close to each other. Um, I feel like our kids have almost grown up together, uh, but he's been a, a big part. Obviously, the accolades through the national office, has, you know, that he's won the uh, the Spirit Award, and he's been a part of nationals for a long time now. And uh, Guys like that just make the sport worth, worth coming out and keeping playing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just been it's been a great ride. I, I, I love, like I said, I love the, the class. I love the rest of the classes and how the sports continue to grow. Um, and, you know, people like I mentioned, Hayward Wagner, building that interest in, in promoting the, the sport and building it further outside of maybe just the same people showing up. Um, I love that, that part of it. And I think it just makes everything a lot more interesting and makes it worth coming out year after year. And even with the early Pro Solo Bundle last week, you know, I was right there at 3 o'clock Eastern time signing up. <laughs> Yeah, I, I yeah. made myself resist. I'm like, I would like to go to every single one, um, but I've got to plan that out with the wife and family and make sure things could happen. <laughs> I'm like, at this point, I, while you were talking, I was like, oh, could I just fly out and say I could co-drive if I could help somebody by warming their tires in a Corvette or whatever? Because if I get enough events in my <laughs> normal car, what would I care? That, that's a bucket list item yeah. or a continual bucket list item. To If I could do it once, I'd probably want to do it again and again, just make them all. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I do too. And yeah, you do have to kind of balance that with the wife and family. Um, but you got to pick and choose what you want to do. Um, and I'm lucky enough, my wife has been great for me in, in giving me a little bit of that freedom and then allowing to bring the kids along. My son got started in a junior cart when he was nine. So he and I teamed up and we went all over the place, him in the junior cart, me in the shifter. And then he jumped into the shifter when he got his permit. My daughter then, about Four years ago, she started running some events, and it, it pays off. I mean, as a parent, you see your kids, when they get to the street, you give them the keys to the car to go out of the public road. I don't have to worry about them. I only have to worry about the other idiots. I know my kids are not those idiots because they've, they've done everything you can do with throwing a vehicle sideways. They're not going to go and, and be lost behind the wheel. So that's been a big part that my wife was able to help let us grow in that way and, and bring the kids along. Because if I couldn't bring the kids to the event, at some point, it would have been cut off, and I, you know, you just can't do it anymore. Um, it's really hard if you can't make it a family event. Yeah, great point, sir. And that's where I think I'm getting my wife always been like, yeah, when they get old enough, that'd be great. You'll take them, like both, and I just, I've taken one several times. You'll take both to the event for a weekend? Really? Like, like <laughs> yeah. bonus points right here? It's almost like a honeydew item list okay. bonus? There's one caveat to that, and that is don't hold yourself to the same result standard when you've got your whole family there, as you would if you were by yourself. <laughs> I believe, um, yep, that's in the back of my mind of, oh, can I still, of course, I don't think I focus very well. Can I still just go out and drive? Even though I have to run around with the kids and the cars and all that. Or I need to get, I need to pay somebody that can come with me. In turn, I, I need an intern that will help the kids' carts that understand them. There we go. 
Yeah, and it, it takes a while. And I got to the point where I could, with my kids, have them there and kind of get myself ready, get them ready. But really, it starts to, a week before at home where I would have the cart set up. I knew what gear I wanted, probably what jetting I wanted. I had the tires mounted. I had everything ready to go. So I would limit how much I have to do on the site because I had to then manage get the kids ready and, you know, suits and fuel and all that stuff. So you have to kind of figure all that out of how you manage it. But the first time you show up with wife and kids in tow and you expect to be at the front of the pack, it's going to be a bit of a rude awakening. I, I'd be Actually, my wife was there. I'd probably be a little scattered brain for her at first. If she could just make sure the kids were okay, I'd probably like that. I'd be like, okay, I now leave for an hour and I'm going to make some runs. I'll wave at you. That, oh, you got it because they're not allowed in, in grid anyway. Oh, perfect. I'm thinking there's still a, there's still a chance I could maybe focus. I'll let, I'll let you have another subject on and talk about marital success. If that's your strategy, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might need to have someone who's uh, I've been married a long time, but uh, that's a tough strategy to just dump the kids on the wife and say, I'm going to be gone for a couple of hours, and she's sitting out there in the middle of an autocross site with 90 degrees with a couple of kids and um, just port a it's a frustrating experience if she's not out there competing and she doesn't get your help with the kids, I'll tell you that. With my wife, she's been a saint to help me out, um, but it's not easy. <laughs> oh, exactly. No, yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't dare push, push too far there, <laughs> for sure. Well, I thank you for all the time and insights. It was great. It was fun. Yeah, thanks, Kent. I, I appreciate you having me on. I love the series. Like I said, I listen to a bunch of them. You know, they're great for the road trips. They're great for, you know, look, Running time, you got to, you know, you're out there running in the park for an hour, and you just, you just throw in the the podcast, and um, you learn a lot of great things. I, I hope people realize how much you can learn from listening to Russell and Peters and Tom Reynolds and Pilata and these guys talk about their own strategies and how they got to where they are. It's fascinating stuff you can glean from it. Oh, yeah, that's and people say the same thing in different ways, and I think people will clue into that. And one thing I keep hoping I'll do, I have lots of ideas. It's following through. That's a challenge for me is if people have certain questions based off this, let's say for you, I'm hoping you can have a deal where you could just call a number and record an answer. So if people have questions, even if we don't get around to recording them, people should share the questions on Facebook or somewhere else or send them to me, even for specific people or just in general. I'd love to be able to follow up with like a 10 minute interview with somebody or a 15 minute, you answer a few questions if they came in. If you were up or if people, or if the guests are up to that, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be a good thing, I'm sure. You know, after listening to, like, the Peters one and knowing that he owned a shifter car for a while, now I kind of want to get back to him and say, really, what did, what did you do with it? Did you do any solos with it, you know, and how did that go? Um, there's a few other ones, you know, you, guys like Pilata, the, you know, O'Gorman that do all this sim racing, and like, okay, what do you do with, you know, your visual training from the sim that carries over? All those kind of things you guys touched on, it'd be cool to get follow-up on that. Yeah, and that's where I'm hoping all you guests would be willing to come back, even if it was even for longer especially with the audio quality for Brian and such. I should try to have those remastered, but that would be great to have people expand upon things and different people are changing their techniques and such as they're going forward or what's changed or what's a new car looking like for the season. So hopefully more and more of that. And then I'm trying to work on the process to get people to help me get these out because I'm much better at recording them than, produce, than put, sending them out to you all. So y'all can also bug me and berate me online like, when's the next show coming? Because I have a few sitting there right now that I could push out and should push out. Hopefully, by the time you've heard this one in January, the other two are already out. So, no, I thank you again for all the time, Larry. It was, it was fun. Oh, Lefty. Is there anything to say about Lefty? Uh, yeah, okay, I'll give you that story. This is, um, not everybody knows this one, but it's a good one. So I mentioned guys like Mike the Nut McClintock, and I mentioned Scyther. They are key to the whole name of Lefty. So 2002, I start co-driving with Alan Scyther. And we're in Milwaukee for this two-day divisional event. I think this is my second event ever to ship a car. Alan's got his 10-year-old or whatever he was, his son Colin, with him there. And Colin now is, you know, college kid, 22, 23, whatever he is. And we're all at this event. It's hot. Day's been long. We're just Saturday afternoon, and McClintock's working on his motorhome, and he needs something. He needed me to throw something to him. And now, meanwhile, this whole day I've been complaining about how far I'm eight seconds back from Scheidler. I'm just struggling. And these guys are busting balls, as anybody normally would with me. And I, whatever McClintock needed, I picked it up, and I threw it to him. And I'm left-handed, and I throw left-handed. And Scheidler, not missing a beat, goes, hey, Mike, Mike, I know, I, I, know why, I know why he can't drive a shifter cart. 
because the shifter's on the right side and he's left-handed. And from that point, and the rest of the night, let's just say there may have been a few Manhattans that were drank that McClintock was pouring, um, that it kind of accelerated it. But they just kept calling me lefty and said, well, you can't drive because you're left-handed. You know, you just can't drive a shifter card. It can't be done. And it's just the name kept going. The best part of the story is fast forward t- Sunday afternoon. The next day, again, I'm, you know, I'm sucking. I'm way behind what Alan Shidler's putting down. And the, a couple of the Sebastian, uh, I forget the guy's name, was there. A couple really fast drivers. And I'm like dead last. End of the day comes, we're packing up, and Alan Scheidler's little 10-year-old kid, Colin, is sitting in the back of Alan's van, and he's crying. And Alan and, and Mike had gone off to the trophies to go collect their trophies or whatever they're doing, and Colin's just sitting there by himself crying. Like, Mike, Colin, what's going on? What, what, what's happening? You okay? He says, yeah. He's got that, you know, the 10-year-old or 9-year-old sobbing, you know, where he's trying to talk. And, yeah, well, the other kid, he, his cart wasn't legal, and he was cheating, and, and I, I should have won a trophy. And, I, and he's just trying to get the whole story out, and he can't do it. And I said to him, I said, Colin, did you have fun? Said, yeah, yeah, I guess I did. Did you like driving, Colin? Yeah, yeah, it was fun, it was fun. Look, Colin, I had a fun time, too. I'm five seconds on each course here behind your dad, and look how much fun I'm having. I, I don't care if I'm not driving well. And the kid, without missing a beat, goes, yeah, but you're not fast because you're left-handed. <laughs> and I just looked at the kid, and I looked at the kid, and I just walked away. I said, that's it. I am done. And from that point, they just kept calling me lefty. It's kind of stuck. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I asked. I had that written down. I was like, ah, oh, should I bring this up? Should I not? I didn't ask you before the show. That's, but you're left-handed. That's the reason. It's probably an advantage of all things. <laughs> yeah, that, that's. After that moment, I'm like, oh, my God, all right, fine, this is going to stick. You know? And ironically, you know, apparently a few people who are left-handed have won nationals in the carts. Um, so it hasn't really held back, but it certainly makes it a heck of a story from being the whole left-handed thing. But it's good. It separates me. I hate the name Larry anyway, so lefty's always better. But you're <laughs> left-handed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you beat him, you're going to go and say, and I'm left-handed. <laughs> In the middle of crying and sobbing and wallowing in his own self-pity, he's got enough in him to mock my left-hand business. Well, no, he just thinks that if he was left-handed, he'd have an excuse. You haven't, and he didn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I wish I had that handicap. <laughs> I don't have that reason. I should, build a, I should be beating you even right now. You're left-handed. <laughs> exactly, yep. <laughs> oh, that was Funny. fun. That was fun. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Very fun. All right. Yeah. yeah, thanks again for the time and all the insights. Hey, thanks, Ken. It's been a lot of fun. Cool. I wrote the cut time right there, so that was fun. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely a lot of fun. Cool. I, I, I went over my 6 o'clock to pick up food for the family. Usually I sit there and talk for way too long afterwards, but no, I appreciate it. That, that was a lot of fun. A lot of, a lot of nice insights yeah. and some stories tossed in as well. Well, it's funny. We talked a lot of different stuff, but um, you go back to when – you first saw the, the post about PJ's interview, yeah. and I had made something. You, you, you know the, the deal with PJ and I, right? No. After interview, that we have basically the same voice. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, especially when we're both announcing at an event, people can't tell us apart. Oh. Um, so a couple of years ago, his, his ex-wife now, um, she was running ladies' class like second heat one day, and She's looking around, like, you know, I guess thinking, where's PJ, where's PJ? And then she hears me announce it. This is his wife, Jenna. She's hearing the voice over the speakers, and she's saying to herself, why is PJ announcing? He's supposed to be here helping me with a car. Oh, gosh. And, like, five seconds later, PJ walks up. And it was, we kind of realized, wait a second, we, we fooled his wife. <laughs> I think there's something to this. So... That's kind of the running joke now that, you know, you'll see PJ posting online that, you know, I, that Larry did a great job announcing at the Northeast region event, or I'll post and say, you know, PJ was at some event in Toledo and, you know, back and forth. So okay, um, okay. That's, that's, it, that's where that all came from, the, the joke about that. So when you go back and you listen to this in editing, think about the voice of PJ and mine, and you'll probably find they're pretty close. All right, cool. Yeah, no, well, yeah, if the, if the cell phones are treating equally, good point. Yeah, no, I thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Cool. I, I can't right. wait to hopefully see you out there. I really do hope to make it out east for some pro solos. I didn't even check if they sold out, but if I can weasel my way into a car, I don't really want to drive that far. But if I get if I get yeah. my SSC car together, maybe it could happen. Oh, okay. Yeah, Toledo's going to be packed. 
um, most of the people that bundle are trying to get into Toledo. Yep. And it'll, yeah, you know, I, I don't know, 150 is the max they'll do by the bundle. I haven't looked, but I'm sure that Toledo's already booked for that. And as soon as it opens for real registration, it'll be full in like five minutes. Yep. Yep. It's gonna be packed. We'll, we'll um, see as the season that, begins here what I can do. And some people are like, oh, yeah, you definitely drive my car. And once again, I should not even be picky if I can get in any car. That's where I, I haven't given up on the yeah. Civic, although the new head I had refreshed is not on the car. But <laughs> at least you're to get out for spring nationals. I mean, that's probably like the closest national event for you anyway. Oh, yeah. Like um, James Darden made it out there six or seven times last year. And I started telling people, I'm like, oh, it's, it's a no-brainer. Especially in an S yeah. SSC car. Like I bought a water one from Texas that's getting a replacement engine. It doesn't, it's salvaged. It doesn't matter. I can drive that thing as long as it doesn't mess up anything down to Lincoln sure. in seven hours. I'm so looking forward to yeah. not towing, honestly, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure SEC car is perfect for that. Yeah. That'll be interesting. I'm interested to see how that plays out, what kind of popularity it does bring. And I'm hearing people like yourselves who are competitive drivers stepping into it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how that plays out. There's going to be a lot of guys who are going to get into this and, there aren't going to be that many trophies to give. <laughs> hey, oh, exactly. Yeah, that's a, and it's that's the fun. It's almost like an SSR type thing, although it's not those guys. But it's really like, can I compete on equal footing? And for anybody like me that's not keeping their car maintenance up, it's like a godsend. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's less stuff on a newer car that I have to mess with, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally a driver's class. Uh, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to watch. And, you know, this is kind of an experiment of picking a chassis, picking the tune. Everything's all set pre-done for you all you can do is change tire pressures it's it's um it's, it's interesting i'll be kind of keeping that being in the mod world i pay attention to a lot of that stuff but i certainly like to watch those things and getting back to the announcing thing getting out the nationals if i end up being lucky enough to calling ssc i, I kind of want to see what's it really going to be like you know let's uh, kind of watch it play out Yeah, like, you know, I've got I've been lucky enough that like Sam Carp and I have kind of been uh, co uh, chiefs of announcing, um, and going back to Hayward when he did before, they basically gave me first pick. Um, you know, whatever I wanted to do, I, I had it. So I was picking SSR every year. So I announced a couple of GJ wins, um, the Grant Reeve year. I announced that one. You know, just awesome battles because I I got to pick the premier class to do it. It was awesome. So I'll be looking at. You know, which one do I want this time around that I, I get to call? So, yeah, it's, it's kind of a – it's a nice thing. It's, it's good to, to have that opportunity, but I don't take it lightly. I always make sure I do the homework and, and bring the whole A game with it, too. Yeah. All right, man. Well, hopefully we'll see you in the – yeah, be cool. All right? All right, man. Later. Thanks for listening. For the show notes and contact information, please visit autocrosstalk.com. There you can also subscribe so that we can keep you up to date on new shows as they come out. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on iTunes for the upcoming shows. You can connect to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autocrosstalk. You can share your thoughts, your insights, your questions, your suggestions there. Also, share with your friends. Hopefully you found it entertaining and motivating, and hopefully other people will as well. It's been fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and check back next week for the next show.